Good. Okay, well, um, I think firstly the purpose, um, it's of course about the rare earth industry in, in South Africa and Southern Africa and, and actually the greater SADC region um, to include countries like Malawi. Um, and yes, uh, <clears throat> I have heard the, uh, the, the, the um, frustration expressed that, you know, we have spoken a lot about the topic of rare earths in, in the region, uh, but there doesn't seem to be much happening. Um, so, you know, um, <clears throat> if we, I think this is actually the first time, at least that, that I'm aware of, that we get such a, a collection of the role players in the rare earths of the region actually together to, to talk to one another. So I think that that is a, a bit of an achievement on its own already. Uh, and I thank all of you for your participation and willingness to actually, <coughs> to actually um, take part in it. Uh, everybody, um, you know, was, was very willing so, um, and, and, and very cooperative for which I'm very grateful. <clears throat> So um, this is a golden opportunity to just figure out, you know, if, um, if, uh, if, 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 if it's for any lack of co collaboration or for any lack of support from certain quarters that we can, and you know, now is the opportunity to figure out who is waiting upon whom. Um, and um, specifically core to what I'm trying to explore is, is whether we are just, you know, each one on his own, um, or whether there is in fact um, merit in some sort of a cooperation amongst the individual role players. Um, you probably all know that Mintech has been punting the, um, the, um, the, the centralized refinery, uh, the SACREF concept, um, you know, if we, and, and, and really the reasoning is that, that we don't have any one single uh, deposit that, that can really support the refinery on its own, but collaboratively and, and you know, collectively amongst the various deposits that they are, um, we, it seems that we could actually um, justify a, a um, refinery. But I mean, who is it for Mintech to say that uh, that is what people should do? I mean, uh, how are people from different um, companies and with different shareholders um, actually going to see the world in the same way and actually um, agree on a, a combined plan to and, and actually pool resources and, and actually sharing one another's risk to go forward with, uh, with such a concept. So that's, that's at the core, at the heart of what I would like to explore today. Uh, let me expand that uh, a little bit further. Is it possible? Is it even desirable to develop a commonality of vision and purpose um, and of course, there needs to be mutual trust, you know, to be built, I suppose, um, for collaboration towards a, re a centralized refinery. Um, and if so, then um, maybe we can even make some headway as to lay out a bit of a roadmap as to how we should proceed. What is actually just the next step? Um, can we, if, if there is a next step to be taken, can we dish out a bit of work or agree on, on a future milestone um, you know, by which time we may meet again and see how, what progress we have made. Um, some background that I can just throw in, just that to be keep in the back of our minds, where nobody needs reminding about the global, the global mega trends towards clean energy and electromobility that is actually um, driving the rare earth industry. Uh, of course, there's the domination of China that we all know about. If we just take stock of what we have in the SADC region, um, the resources are on a world scale. Hey, Pietrus, sorry to interrupt you, Pietrus. Uh, do you maybe want to turn your camera off? Um, your connection is a bit bad. So we are losing a lot of your presentation. Okay, I hope that's marginally better. Okay, let's try, thanks. Okay. Uh, if we take stock of what we have in the SADC region, uh, as I say, on, the, on a global scale, our resources are of relatively modest size. Even collectively, if you plot this on a pie chart, we hardly make a slice in the pie. 
Um, but we have Steenkamp's graph, for example, which is a relatively high grade, although it's also high in thorium. Uh, and we have other deposits which collectively you know, sort of uh, build up to something. Um, we have actually tested a basic SACRIF flow sheet um, at Mintec. Um, we have in the likes of Nexa and the Thorium Network, we do have nuclear and isotope expertise in the country uh, that we can actually apply maybe to do, you know, to deal with the Thorium on the one hand, also maybe to um, actually derive isotope uh, products from some of the heavier rare earths. Um, There is, uh, let me just throw this in for whatever effect it may have. USA and China have both at governmental levels announced rare earth strategies. So they are, you know, that there are two superpowers sort of like um, basically uh, lining up against one another as to, do, to protect their territories and, and, and their interests in, in rare earth. So that is, that is, must be setting some scene in the in this arena in which we will be playing here. Uh, what will those strategies, for example, do to the supply and demand price kind of balance? Um, we have an African proverb that, that says, when elephants fight, the, the grass gets trampled, you know, and, and um, we are probably, we are sort of like more of the grass than, than any of the participating elephants. So, <clears throat> but well, maybe we get trampled in it, but maybe actually that creates an opportunity. Um, how do you want to see that? Um, is there any leverage to be gained because it is of such importance that we could actually form alliances or, you know, is there special leverage to be gained from a market dynamic like that? I'm not trying to answer any of these. I'm throwing these in hopefully that, hoping that it, some of it will come out in the presentations that we're about to have or that we can leave in, uh, for some further discussion at the end of the, of, after the sessions. So what we'll do from, from here on, we have an agenda, um, a few presentations, and uh, the first one is gonna be Steenkamp scroll. And then, uh, well, if we, uh, this is the, the sequence that I'm proposing, if, if there's any objections or, or any difficulties, we, we can swap that out. But I have uh, Steenkamp scroll and then Tronox, then Mintec, then sort of a shared time slot between IDC and Minerals Council, because I indicated they have just you know, a few um, brief comments to make. Lastly, from the DMRE, um, as the authority upon whom we, we depend um, for the um, regulatory uh, aspect of it, then we'll have a short break. And, um, and then we'll follow a, a forum of discussion where, it's, where, it's, where we open for, for any comments and questions and, and suggestions from the floor. I will probably have uh, collected a few questions by then that I'll be throwing in and, and to lead the, um, the discussion. Uh, and we simply see where it takes us and hopefully what I would like to aim at is that we actually arrive at some sort of a logical conclusion at the end of the day and not just have ex you know, exchanged interesting facts with one another, but that we actually create a bit of a vision or that, you know, even if we were to say, look, it's best that each is just going his own way and wish we one another luck, you know, that's, that's also maybe a conclusion. It's not the one I'm hoping for, but if that's the realistic one, uh, can we just say that to one another for once and then we, <laughs> we know where we stand. Uh, but okay, without any further ado then, I will um, exit and, and hand over the screen to, to Trevor from Stentum Scroll. Thank you very much, Petrus. Over um, to you, Trevor. Thank you. Um, here we are. Have you? Can you all see it? Can see it. <clears throat> can just put it into presentation mode, please. Yeah, um, one second. Um, first of all, I'll stop. Um, how do you do the presentation? Right?
There we are. Right, so I'm going to talk to you about Steenkamp Scrum. And uh, we say world-class, and I, I hope we uh, justify that uh, claim. Uh, I'll show you why we believe we are that. Sorry, um, Trevor, uh, to interrupt you, you are still on, uh, we can still see your slide uh, panel on the side. Sorry for the delay. If you can just click on the display settings on the top, uh, on, right on top, it says show taskbar and next to it display settings. Just click on the display settings. Because we can see the notes. Nothing comes up on display settings. It's at the top of the page. Are you using two screens at the moment? Yeah, I think that will help. Sorry. Yeah, one screen, yeah. Can you help me? How's that? That's great, thank you. Sorry about the delay. But that doesn't need any repetition. I'm so sure you're all familiar with the, the rare earth elements. Now, briefly about Steenkamp's Graal, it's about 350 kilometers north of Cape Town, uh, near Van Rainsdorf, close to Saldana Bay, um, just off the N7. Our mining right area covers 474 hectares, although the mine itself only covers about uh, the mining area about 25 or 30 hectares. Uh, our company does own three surrounding farms that uh, cover 7,000 hectares as a buffer area for future mining activity. Um, and our mine is in South Africa and in the Western Cape province. So there's a long history of um, a long mining tradition uh, there's a map which shows where it is. Um, it's near Bitterfontein, in that northern part of the uh, Western Cape province. Um, just to show you where it is on the map. Now, this history is very important. Um, back in uh, about 1950, the British government wanted to buy thorium. And um, that's when Anglo-Americans started the mine. And uh, they mined it for a 10 year period. And this track record is, if in our minds, uh, very significant, very important, uh, because it's a track record that is um, impressive. For a 10 year period, Anglo American mined Steenkamp Scroll. Uh, they removed 126,269 tons of ore during this period. They kept very good records um, there, as they always do. And we have those records. Uh, at that scene camp trial, they produced monazite concentrate, uh, nearly 60,000 tons of it. And that 60,000 tons was shipped to England to a company called Thorium Limited near Manchester. 
Uh, there they cracked the monazite into the thorium and the rare earth fractions, and they sold the thorium to British nuclear fuels. And during that 10 year period from 52 to 63, uh, British nuclear fuels at Sellafield uh, tried to make nuclear weapons with thorium. And uh, I went to Sellafield a few years ago, and they said that it was very frustrating because they tried to make a nuclear weapon with thorium, and after 10 years of trying, they failed, <laughs> so they gave up. And uh, that is when they stopped buying thorium from Thorium Limited, and when Thorium Limited stopped buying, buying monazite concentrate from Steenkamp Scroll. So the mine was closed, not because it was mined out, but because the customer, the British government, uh, stopped buying thorium. Uh, but that track record is exceptional. And it demonstrated um, that the total rare earth grade uh, in the ore that was removed over that 10 year period was over 23%. Um, and I, I think that's very special. These are some pictures of the mine at the time with housing, people uh, lived on the mine, some of the equipment that was used. Uh, the decline shaft that went down the mine. Um, that mine, the shaft is still intact. Uh, it needs to be re-equipped. Uh, but the mine infrastructure is pretty much in place. Um, for a period of, um, and then the mine was dormant for many, many years uh, because rare earth prices were low. Um, and that is the main reason why rare earth <laughs> projects um, in the past uh, were not developed is that for most of the time in the last 25, 30 years, rare earth prices have been very low on average. And it's only in the last couple of years that rare earth prices have moved up significantly as a result of the rapid growth in the production and sales of electric vehicles and wind turbines, uh, that now um, more and more projects will become uh, economical and financeable. So uh, during the last 10 years, um, um, the company has changed ownership, but one of the owners, um, a Canadian company uh, invested about 500 million rand at Steen Kemskral and did lots and lots of work. The, as you can see, these uh, pictures are about um, the headgear at the mine shaft. Um, we applied for and got a water use license and there's a water processing plant there, a re reverse osmosis plant. We have generators. Um, that's some of the water coming out of our boreholes. Uh, we need water to mine, um, so having a mining right is one thing, but we can't mine and process the ore without water, so we applied for a water use license and we got it. Um, so we have that in place. Um, Anglo-American left behind some tailings dumps, um, and we have consolidated those tailings dumps into this uh, area that you can see. It's about 50,000 tons of material that still contains about um, five or six percent um, uh, rare earths. Um, now, most monazite is found in, uh, in mineral sands uh, or, uh, operations like um, Eric, like uh, your Tronox. Uh, there are not many hard rock monazite veins uh, such as we have at Steenkampskron. And uh, you can see there are very, uh, this is obviously a, an exceptional area where the Con the, the, um, you can see uh, the granitic host rock and the monazite vein uh, very clearly distinguished. Um, so that's what a lot of our monazite looks like. It's visible uh, in the mine. The average thickness of the vein is 60 centimeters. The strike length is about one kilometer 20. Um, the ore, obviously, monazite contains all of the rare earths. Uh, very importantly, uh, pretty much throughout the world, the ratio between thorium and rare earths is fixed. It's stable. And so it would be wonderful to have high rare earth grades and low thorium grade, but nature didn't create <laughs> uh, the reserves like that. If you have a high rare earth grade in monazite, then you get a high thorium grade as well. Uh, that can't be avoided. So we're very happy to have a high rare earth grade, but it does mean we have to deal with the, the thorium content. Uh, so we do have a, what was called a nuclear license years ago. Uh, it's now a certificate of registration. 
So we've been registered with the NNR for many years. We've been inspected and controlled by the NNR for many years, and we do understand the procedures that we must uh, observe and obey to manage the radioactivity in a responsible way, that not and not expose any of our workers to more than the specified um, maximum um, radiation exposures. There's a rock dump. This rock dump is low grade. Um, Anglo-American did um, some visual sorting of the material when it came out of the mine, and they sent the um, the high grade material to England and um, and uh, left a big dump of low grade material, which will reprocess when the time comes. Um, we spent a hundred million rand on drilling um, all of these holes. 232 drill holes, a total of 28,000 meters of, of uh, core. Uh, and we've produced an NI43101 mineral resource um, estimate, which is 605,000 tons of ore at an average grade of 14.4%. Uh, I want to emphasize that the grade is very variable. There are areas which go down to 1% and 2%. And there are other areas that go up as high as close to 50%. Uh, so it is variable and we will have to blade, blend the ore when we, when we process it. But as you can say, it's been drilled like a pincushion and we have a very um, good knowledge of the ore body uh, within that limited extent. There are possible further extensions to the ore body, uh, both laterally and at depth. These are cores from in the core shed, um, part of that 28,000 meters of core that we have. Another uh, view of the core that we have. So th this work was done, th a lot of work was done to understand the ore body better. This is a uh, picture of the mine and the gray areas are the areas that Anglo-American mined out during that 10 year period. And the white areas are ore blocks that were established at the time and that still exist today, they're unmined. So um, a, a very large amount of the work that is the, to bring the mine back into production has already been done. Um, we have very well-established ore reserves. Uh, this is an indication of where we might find extensions. You can see in the middle, on slightly on the left, the historic mine workings where Anglo-American developed the mine. And then these other, um, spots and triangles and squares are the drill holes that we have that 28,000 meters that uh, show where the extension of the ore body um, is. Um, this is the classification of the mineral resource um, according to the NI43101 standards. Um, and uh, it's a very good solid foundation on which to establish a mine. Uh, the rate at which we will mine it is obviously important, and uh, we hope to have about a 20-year life of mine, 20, 25 years, uh, with this uh, resource. That's the um, shape of the ore body as it goes down. Um, we've only drilled down as far as 160 meters. That's the maximum depth to which we've um, drilled. And um, we believe that there is more below 160 meters and we'll do that in a future um, exploration program. There are faults there, as you can see. We don't know much about those faults, how far down they go. And, uh, and that's um, something we will invest in in the future. Um, this is the composition of our 86,900 tons of ore. And um, I'm gonna do a bit of bragging here. <laughs> um, our neodymium grade is, um, well, that's the percentage in the, in the, in the, of the total. Um, we've got between NDPR, we've got 20,000 tons approximately. Um, terbium we have, dysprosium got, we're also very important for, for magnets. Um, and now what I was going to brag about is that our combined grade NDPR is uh, three and a half percent, uh, and that's <laughs> higher than the total rare earth grades in many other rare earth projects. So we're, we're very um, pleased about that. Um, when it comes to economic value, um, 
as you all know, um, the economic value lies mainly in the NDPR plus dysprosium and terbium. Um, cerium and lanthanum, which together constitute 60% of the rare earth content, uh, are worth practically nothing. So we don't attribute much value to them. Uh, not that they're not used. Um, um, cerium is used in autocats. Um, lanthanum is used uh, in, in oil refineries. It's just that um, as people have produced more and more neodymium and praseodymium, um, the, there's a fixed ratio also with the cerium and lanthanum. So when you produce more neodymium, you end up producing more cerium and lanthanum as well. But the um, rate of growth and demand for lanthanum and cerium is much slower uh, than neodymium and praseodymium. So now there's a surplus of cerium and lanthanum, and we think prices of those will remain low for, for a long time. Um, so I don't want to go in too much detail, um, but the, um, the important things here are that uh, the mine is there and it's uh, in very good condition and um, bringing the mine back into production will be relatively cheap and quick. We think that we can bring the mine back into production for about five million dollars in about um, three months. Um, and compared to a greenfield site, that is incredibly cheap and quick. Uh, when you're looking at a greenfield site for a rare earth mine, the numbers will be multiples of that. And in addition to that, there's uh, the, the broken ore and the tailings dam that I mentioned earlier, which is part of our, well, the tailings is uh, a part of our resource. Um, but there's, um, I mentioned this earlier, the white air, the gray areas are the mined out areas from those 10 years of mining and the white areas are ore blocks uh, that are ready to mine. And in this, just in this area that I'm showing you now, um, uh, our mining could last for about 10 years. Uh, but uh, that does, obviously there are other areas which we, where we've drilled and where we have cores, which will extend the life of the mine to well over 20 years. This is how we plan to mine. Um, Graham Sodden is our mining engineer and he will um, prepare the mining plan, but, um, and I, I won't go into this much right now. This is what the mine looks like underground. Those are mined out areas um, where the monazite reef was taken out by Anglo-American and uh, they left this empty area behind. That's mined out. Another mined out area. So you can see the reef in places is three, four, five meters thick uh, and it grades um, 10, 20, 30% rare earths. Another mined out area with supports. one of our um, tunnels to access the ore body. There are rails um, still down um, on the ground from 50 years ago, uh, but in many places, the rails were put down on monazite ore. So one of the things we'll do is uh, take out those old rails, uh, clean out all of the monazite, <clears throat> so that uh, when workers go in and out of the mine, they will not be walking on monazite and they won't be exposed to the radiation. Um, here we have prospecting rights on a few other farms around us where we um, might be able to also um, access additional um, monazite. Um, yeah, our prospecting rights, um, we, we need to think about those. Um, <clears throat> then what we're going to do um, at the mine when the ore comes up out of the mine, we'll do this whole procedure down here to um, produce a monazite concentrate in, initially. <clears throat> uh, we want to produce a monazite concentrate that contains over 90% monazite. And um, there's very strong demand for that, um, not only in China, but in other parts of the world as well. So uh, we could uh, and probably will initially sell monazite concentrate. 
to um, and several buyers around the world. Obviously, we want to add more value to that. So uh, at uh, some point, um, we will crack the monazite using the caustic soda process to separate the thorium from the rare earths. Um, we are registered with the National Nuclear Regulator, and we can then um, store that uh, thorium at Steen Kemp's uh, The terms of our uh, relationship with the NNR, our licensing conditions, allow us to mine, uh, process, store, and transport naturally occurring radioactive materials. Um, so we can store that thorium um, at Steen Kemp's and we very much believe, uh, I'll just say a word about this, that uh, thorium will eventually be developed uh, for nuclear power. And so we want to keep the thorium carefully for that purpose. Um, when we do crack the monazite, we'll then produce a mixed rare earth carbonate. Uh, and that also is a saleable product. There are many uh, companies around the world that separate rare earths. Uh, to whom we could um, sell that product. Um, at a later stage, we would like also to separate the individual rare earths um, at Steen Kemskrall or near Steen Kemskrall so that we could then sell NDPR. We seem to have lost Trevor, and this is just me. No, it's not. Okay. He's yes. gone. Oh, he's back, gone? I think. Okay. okay, you're back. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm taking. I think I'm. I've gone over my time limit. I think. Um, that's the. Um, no, you've you've got a no. So you take another five minutes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, this is to go from monazite concentrate to mixed rare earth carbonate. That is our flow sheet, and uh, that's how we will do it. And uh, uh, <laughs> I didn't realize I was so close to the end, um, so I didn't take the extra five minutes. But if any of you would like a copy of the presentation, we'd be happy to give it to you. And if anybody wants to visit the mine, we're happy to invite you and show you the mine. Uh, what we do believe in view of our um, licensing um, arrangements uh, with both, uh, with, well, with all of them, we have a mining right, uh, we have an approved environmental management program, we have a water use license, uh, we have the certificate of registration with the National Nuclear Regulator. So we would like to, would like you to consider, you were talking about a centralized rare earth refinery. Um, Maybe we could be a cornerstone of that in view of our um, licensing arrangements. And we would be happy to do that. Um, there's great potential for expansion in the future. Um, we're going to start off by producing 5,000 tons of monazite concentrate per year. That will contain about 2,700 tons of TREO. Uh, and that will give us about a 25-year life of mine. Uh, but if we find more reserves and the, the deposit is bigger, um, we could increase um, our production volumes and potentially double it to 10,000 tons of monazite concentrate um, and 5,400 tons of TREO. Uh, and then also um, possibly there's lots of monazite um, in Southern Africa uh, but not everybody's got the kind of license uh, to permit the uh, cracking of the monazite. So we might be able to buy monazite concentrate from um, other producers. And uh, Eric, you and I have discussed that um, from uh, the Western Cape area, from um, the Richards Bay area. There's also monazite in Mozambique and Madagascar. Uh, that we could bring to Seen Camps Call for processing. And if we have access to that large resource base, then we could um, substantially increase production volumes at Steen Camps Call and use the infrastructure that we have to uh, crack them on as I store the thorium and produce rare earth products. Um, thank you. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer.
Sure, thanks, Trevor. It, uh, it, it reads like a really good story. It's, um, it, it, it sounds really exciting. Um, we have a few minutes for, for questions, and if, if I may kick off with the first one. The, the flow sheets that you show there, have you actually ha had them tested, or uh, are they based on reports of previous instances where they have been tested? Uh, I'm not the best person to answer that. Uh, Robbie Lowe um, and Tim Crombie, who's with us, um, both chemical engineers could answer that much better than I. But we've done lots and lots of test work in many different places, and we're quite confident that those flow sheets will work. Okay. And then uh, another one, I don't know, it, it, you don't, you're not obliged to answer, but uh, have, have you, are you at the stage where you've already um, negotiated offtake agreements and so on, or is, is that still a little bit in the future? We have not signed any contracts with anybody yet. Uh, we have expressions of interest from um, several different companies that want to buy monazite concentrate. Uh, we also have expressions of interest from people who want to buy um, mixed rare earth carbonate and uh, also expressions of interest from people who want to buy separated rare earth products. So uh, a lot depends on time and, and financing. You know, the cost of bringing the mine back into production and building a monazite concentrate plant for that 5,000 tons a year is, is, is modest. So we're going to do that first. Uh, and then to build a monazite cracking plant uh, involves a much bigger investment and more time. Uh, so that will come at a later stage. Uh, and then building a rare earth separation factory is then a, a, a bigger, more complex issue uh, when it comes to both financing and the technology. So we expect to develop this project in phases um, yeah. over a five-year period. Uh, and we hope, uh, we plan to list the company on a stock exchange, raise money and start this year. Yeah, and get some cash flow going and sort of manage the risk in a, in a stage-wise manner, as you say. That's right, yes. Yeah. There's another, I can give two minutes for any other questions from the floor. Uh, Zitza, I see you've got your hand up. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Petrus. Um, just a question, maybe more for you, Petrus, than Trevor, but, uh, you know, since Trevor and, and the company has been involved in it so long, they also have an answer. Um, in terms of the SADC, uh, when you spoke about the resources in Africa, you had, uh, you know, the South African ones. Um, you have mentioned Malawi, um, but what other, what uh, other? Tan Tanzania and um, uh, Namibia are two other countries. I think uh, Mozambique also. Thank There's you. actually quite a few Southern African countries. It's not oh. only South Africa. <laughs> Sorry. Bless you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, if the question is, um, are we willing to receive material from all of these different places for processing, um, we are receptive to that idea. To act as like a toll refiner or a toll treater? Yes, in theory, in principle, um, we are willing to consider that, yes. Well, thank you very much, Trevor. I think that that as an introduction sets uh, the scene very nicely for, for everybody else who's coming afterwards. Um, so uh, it was very good having your, you as an as a opening speaker, um, because I think the rest of the discussion can, can, can build on that. Um, thank, thank you very much. Um, there's another one, Isaac. Oh, okay. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, Trevor Isaac here from IDC again. Uh, Hi Isaac. Yeah, and good afternoon to everybody here. Trevor, we've been talking almost over a decade now. We have visited the mines on several locations. The IDC, you know, we, you know, obviously this being uh, one of the major resources that we have in the country. You know, we're placing a lot of emphasis on that. Um, you know, I'm sharing uh, the frustration from uh, you know uh, Pietras, uh, you know, when he called this uh, meeting. When are we doing something, you know, there's been so much planning and talking and stuff. 
Uh, what is happening with this uh, monocyte concentrate? Are there plans for that? Uh, do you want finance for that? Can we at least have a baby step kind of approach to this thing, you know, because the Big Bang has failed, you know, just at least somebody start doing something, then, then things will start moving. Can we latch on to this uh, monocyte concentrate project? Is, the, is, is it happening? What is happening there? Yes. Um, the reason why not much has happened in, with rare earth projects in the last 10 years is most of the time um, rare earth prices have been very low and uh, investors have not been willing to invest their money for a low return. Uh, in the last year, maybe two, uh, this has changed. The pricing uh, environment has changed as a result of electric vehicles and wind turbines mainly. The prices of NDPR and dysprosium and terbium have doubled and doubled again practically. So the economics now justify the investment. So yes, we will now proceed with that in investment. <clears throat> and yes, the first step, you mentioned baby steps. Uh, we want to do baby steps one at a time so we don't fall on our faces. Uh, and that first step is to bring the mine back into production at a rate, uh, at a modest rate. And we can't sell ore out of the mine. We must do the initial step of making a monazite concentrate. So those are the two baby steps that we will do uh, first. Um, and we, yes, I know we've, Isaac, we've spoken about this for a very long period of time and we'd be very happy to talk with you again. Thank you, Trevor. And I, I see Sydney, you've got your hand up. Can we make this the last question because we are eating into Eric's time now, um, but uh, please go ahead. Yeah, I'm not going to put the question. Thank you very much. I'm just going to make a comment that based on what Trevor Blanche has mentioned that they have a resource of 89,000 um, of metric ton and Rodman Mining is sitting at the resource, estimated resource of 569 million tons. And from all the lanternodes that are applicable, uh, Broadman mining is sitting on 15 of them. This is just a comment that I want to make. Whatever you're taking note, <laughs> we all yeah. are. Yes. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, Sydney. Okay, um, can we then proceed um, and, and give an opportunity to Eric to, to um, give us some um, his view from, from the Tronox perspective? Thank you, Eric. Yep, let me know if you can see this. Um, it should be uploading in just a minute. Yes, we can see it, Eric. Okay, and I'm putting it in presentation mode. So hopefully that is uh, fully on the screen now. Yes, it is. Thank you. Okay, good. Um, uh, thanks for, for going first, Trevor, and uh, taking the bullets. And um, also you allowed me to uh, to get my second cup of coffee here. So cheers. Uh, it's quite early in the morning here in the central time zone in the U.S. Uh, for those of you I have not met, uh, my name is uh, Eric Bender. I'm the vice president of strategy. Um, which covers strategic planning and the, str the strategy side of M&A for, uh, for Tronox, as well as business intelligence. <clears throat> um, I'm located in Houston, which is unusual. Uh, if you'll see our, our map, uh, you won't see anything in Houston. Uh, I work from a remote office. Uh, thanks to COVID, most of us have, um, have, have sort of moved that direction. Tronox is actually very flexible in that. So I work from Houston. I'm the only employee, as far as I know, that, that's in the Houston area. But we're quite a globally dispersed company. Um, last year, responsible for around $3.6 in sales. We're listed on the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, one of the uh, differentiators for Tronox is that we're about 85% uh, backward integrated to feedstock materials, which is where our tie to rare earths actually occurs. Um, most of our sales are in the area of TiO2 pigment, again, using that vertical integration strategy. Uh, we consider ourselves one of the, the, the global leaders in this industry. We have nine pigment plants on six continents, uh, six different mines, and five upgrading facilities around the world. Uh, more than 1,200 customers and um, uh, tipping near 6,600 employees at last check. Um, you can see at the top of the page here, our splits um, by region where we sell our products. 
uh, by product class or plot product type is the second pie chart. So you can see our leverage to TiO2. Um, and Zircon, of course, is a very important co-product as well, which comes um, you know, from the mining industry. We do sell some of our feedstocks and other co-products um, also out into the open market. Talk a little bit more about that momentarily. As far as our TiO2 is concerned, it's used in everyday products um, that, that probably all of you on the, on the um, call today uh, are, are using. Um, you know, it's paint and coatings, which is uh, the, the biggest driver of sales. And these coatings can be, you know, in, in many applications from auto coatings to paint that you put, apply to your walls. Plastic, so you think about window frames, uh, plastic furniture, PVC pipes, all those contain TiO2 either to reflect UV light and keep from destroying the PVC or for aesthetic reasons and uh, decorative reasons. Uh, and then paper laminate is the, the biggest part of that green bar for paper and specialty. Uh, paper laminate is used in, uh, in laminate uh, furniture and laminate applications. Um, uh, I circled the, the, um, um, the South African area because we have 2,100 employees in South Africa, which is by far our largest um, region for employment. Uh, it's bigger than, I added these numbers up before the, the meeting, um, the U.S., uh, Latin America, and Europe combined, actually, are about the same size as all of those, and nearly double uh, our um, employee count in Australia, which is rather interesting because uh, most of most people think of Tronox as a U.S. company or an Australian company. They don't think of us as being so heavy in South Africa, whereas South Africa is just a, a massively key region for us. Um, I'm not going to go through everything on this slide. Just want to sort of hit the high points. Uh, we invest a lot as, as a mining company. Um, we invest a significant amount of, of our um, uh, of our earnings back into the business in depleting assets, uh, you know, mines. There's some other things we're investing in currently. Um, you know, Neutron is the, probably the key project within the company right now, which is a, a digital transformation. Um, if you think about our history, we've grown through acquisition. Uh, Exaro, uh, you know, was, uh, was our partner in South Africa for many years, uh, as well as, um, as Australia. You know, we had a joint venture there. Uh, we, we just recently acquired uh, or merged with Crystal, uh, which had operations all over the world as well. Um, and that growth through acquisition lends itself to a lot of inefficiencies when it comes to uh, IT systems. And, um, and so we've sort of taken the best of the best and we're, we're rolling that out uh, around the world today. It's gonna be a multi-year project. It's a, it's a big one that should have significant impacts for our cost. Last year we recorded a uh, record EBITDA of 947 million and we, we got close to that billion dollar level. So. Uh, high margins, uh, among the highest in the, in the industry. Uh, we consider our, ourselves a leader in earnings as well as, as in sales. Um, our latest uh, mining project, which will have something to do with rare earths, which I'll touch on later, is Atlas Kempaspe, which is in, the, is in Eastern Australia. Um, and, and this is required for us to maintain that, that vertical integration, which is uh, part of our DNA at this stage. Uh, generate a lot of free cash flow, which is, uh, you know, um, among the leading companies in, in that area as well uh, in our industry. Um, the other points here, we really reduced our debt. So it, when you grow through acquisition, you tend to acquire a lot of debt. Uh, we've, we've hit our debt target two years ahead of schedule. Um, and, and all the, the ratios you see in the bullet point here uh, were, were, were very key in maintaining low interest rates and, and, and lowering our cost uh, uh, for, for financing. Uh, I didn't want to leave without touching on that last bullet point. Sustainability is a key issue. It's a key issue for this whole meeting. Um, we're we're um, ahead of schedule. Uh, we just made a, a very significant announcement in South Africa to move towards green energy uh, to supply part of our energy needs there, a significant chunk of our energy needs. Um, that's going to really tip us over, and we're actually reevaluating and, and likely going to increase our sustainability goals going forward. Um, the key products here, most of you probably know this already if you know much about Tronox. On the mineral sand side, it's really producing minerals that we use internally. Um, uh, ilmenite, which is used to produce uh, chloride slag, as well as synthetic rutile. Leucoxine, which is a naturally occurring mineral uh, somewhere between ilmenite and rutile uh, in terms of TiO2 level. Rutile is about 95% TiO2. That's also used in our pigment facilities. 
uh, zircon we sell in the open market. Uh, Tyone is our, one of our trademarks for titanium dioxide. And we sell a lot of other co-products. Um, not mentioned on here is pig iron, which is a key output of our smelting facilities in South Africa. Um, and, and also now Saudi Arabia as we're starting up our, our facility there. We also make titanium tetrachloride. I think um, we're the only remaining producer of that, uh, of, of the major pigment producers. I don't think Kimors is producing much or if any at this stage. Um, and that's used in the production of titanium metal as well as it's used in titanium chemistries of all different types. Actually the TI2 industry uses this as a, a seed material to make a, a rutile titanium crystal, titanium dioxide crystal. Um, here are our locations around the world. Um, most notably in, in South Africa, uh, we have uh, you know, the Namaqua facilities. We use the term Namaqua, but it's, it's effectively three separate facilities uh, in the Western Cape. KZN, uh, we have a mine in Fairbreeze um, and a smelter in Impangini. Um, of course, in the Western Cape, we have uh, Saldana Bay as the smelter and Bronza Bay is the mine, mining location. Uh, Australia, we're, we're all over the place. I'm not gonna mention all of those locations. Um, but we're in the West and the East um, with production of synthetic rutio, which is a sort of a key um, a feedstock material used in our pigment facilities. Um, and, and that's located in the West. Uh, the East, it's basically all mining, but it's also important for the production of monazite as a, as a co-product. And, and I'll touch on that uh, as we get towards the end of the slide deck here. Um, on the left-hand side, you can see what our nameplate capacity is. It's a little over a million tons of TI2 pigment, uh, nearly 300,000 tons of zircon processing capacity, uh, significant, almost the same amount of pig iron, a little bit less than that, uh, 250,000 tons, over 400,000 tons of slag, which is used internally, um, 240,000 tons of synthetic rutile, which is used internally, uh, and 182,000 tons of rutile and leucoxine, which is, which is used internally as well. Um, a little bit about our strategy, which may also tie into um, a, a little bit into the rare earths area. Uh, foundationally, we're really focused on cost. So uh, safe, safe quality, low cost, sustainable tons. It's, a, it's sort of a mantra in our company. And you can see that um, moniker in the top right corner of this slide deck. Um, we, we try to produce safe, quality, low cost, sustainable tons through using these four sort of enabling foundational uh, characteristics of our company. Uh, low, low cost pigment at our facilities, feedstock integration, which is again, as I said, it's part of our DNA, it's who we are. Um, a, a global footprint, having um, uh, facilities dispersed around the world is key to maintaining access to cust our customer base, being closer to our customers, being able to produce different grades at different locations. Um, that flexibility, uh, is a key uh, enabler for uh, maintaining strong customer relationships and a strong supply base. And has been very critical, in fact, during the very challenging logistics times we, we find ourselves in today. Uh, we also consider ourselves a technology leader. That's both in smelting, it's in mining technologies, it's in the production of pigment. And not, to, not last, but certainly not least, and probably perhaps most important is our culture, our people and our capabilities. And let's get into our interest in um, the rare earth market. So we have stranded mostly primary, I call it primary, there's probably a little bit of secondary mixed in there, but mostly primary monazite at various locations around the world. Um, our largest stockpile is, in, is at the Namaqua site in the Western Cape. Um, that material is, is, sto is stored in a tailings pile, which is rather substantial in size. It's in the low single digits in terms of percent monazite, um, but, but when you do the math, there's a significant amount of monazite trapped within that, that um, tailings pile. Um, we have a smaller quantity at KZN, none in tailings. It's just really more of an ongoing stream there, and we're investigating ways to, to capture that material. And then we have quite a bit in Australia. We might have some in Brazil. We're, actually, we're actively investigating what we had uh, in, a, in a mine that was recently shut down in Paraíba in Brazil. So we don't think there's much there, but we're gonna take a closer look just to see what we have. Um, so we're not, you know, very different to Trevor. We're not, um, you know, out cracking and leaching 
Um, you know, we're not an active participant in this market. However, all of our monazai is either stored internally or it's being sold through various offtake agreements and, and it's going to China, which is not probably good for, for the industry and not good for anyone. So um, we think we have around uh, 3,000 tons uh, per annum globally. Uh, if you could combine all the sources of material from all six mining locations and various tailing sources and what is recoverable, we believe to be around 3,000 tons per annum, equivalent TREO. Um, now that, a little bit more than half of that is, is in South Africa. Um, you know, the rest would be in Australia. Getting it out and, you know, concentrating the material and getting it into a form where it can be cracked and leached and then potentially processed or refined is going to be challenging. But we're um, actively investigating our options for, for these various sources of material. It, it is spread out, you know, shipping class seven material from one location to another is not ideal. So the ideal scenario is to uh, process the material where it's stored. So that's probably going to be the, the, you know, the default setting for us, but it doesn't mean that's going, going to be the only way we look at this market. Uh, our goal, of course, is to maximize shareholder value. So the options to, uh, to conduct that and how we, how we go about that are being considered now. So it's probably a little bit briefer than normal, but uh, I'm normally a talker, so as, as most of my colleagues would, would uh, agree with, but uh, certainly we'll be uh, open for questions at this stage. Thank you, Eric. Um, is, are there any questions uh, to Eric from the floor? Uh, hi, uh, Dan Kemp here from the Thorium Network. May I quickly ask? Sure. Uh, Eric, uh, just a quick uh, a question on the, the monazar concentrations that you have at Namakwa and um, Kaze and everything. What what sort of percentages monazite do you have in there? What and what is it, uh, what's the difficulty in getting it out and concentrating it at the moment? And what sort of options are you looking at in order to get? Are you looking at just getting a concentrate to sell, or are you looking at a long term process where you're getting the rear of oxides out? Um, so we're mostly looking on the former. I wouldn't say the latter is off the table, but we're, we're primarily looking at the former to answer your last question first. Uh, can't give away exactly what the percentages are, but what I can tell you, it's low single digits at the Namaqua site. It's uh, higher than that um, at KZN. Um, the, the challenge with monazite, you know, is, is the finer grain size. Um, it, it, it tends to have other materials that stick with it when you try to separate it. Um, but we're actively looking at ways to concentrate the material. Uh, you know, the, the viability of that is, is basically a curve, which is one is yield, the other is, um, is how, how high you can concentrate the material. So if you're going to ship this material and you're going to be class seven, um, you know, if we wanted to, to ship it outside of South Africa, which, by the way, wouldn't necessarily be our choice, but um, it's something we will consider. Um, you know, if you're going to ship class seven, you might as well concentrate it all the way up and reduce your cost. So, you know, when you get to a certain point, you start to drop off in terms of yield in, in concentrating the material. So that's really the challenge with, um, with what we have sort of stored. In our other streams, we have streams, you know, around the world, and we have many streams, by the way. I think I counted uh, 11 the other day. Um, you know, we have them as high as 25%, but there aren't many that are that concentrated. And it's low quantities in, in that level of concentration. And they're Thank not you. in South Africa, by the way. Could, could I ask then, um, yeah, I'm not new today. Uh, Eric, would it make any difference to your prospects of actually concentrating it up and selling a concentrate if they were to be, um, a toll treater regionally, you know, of the likes of Steenkamp Scroll, they sort of like get into production and, they, and they're looking around for Manazai to buy in. Um, would, would that change your, your prospects for actually uh, selling that? Yeah, what I would say is shipping class seven is, um, is no small feat. It's extraordinarily <laughs> expensive. Um, it's challenging for the best of, of you know, 
those third parties that do this for a living. Um, it's it's in no one's interest to ship this. Uh, it's it's it would be far preferable to stay you know where it is and process it um, just because of the complexity. Uh, you know that you get into logistics things like um, you know here in Houston you could you can actually ship to Houston from Cape Town, um, but you have so many days to store the material. Uh, there's there are limited storage sites where you could store class seven. Um, it, it's a really complicated you know, uh, animal um, to tackle, if you will. Um, and so it's, it's, quite, um, it's quite preferable to not ship it. It's better to stay in the country where it, where it starts. Yeah. Yeah, so as I say, if, if, if we have a, a, a plant then actually springing up in Southern Africa, sort of for your, um, um, your, your, your Western Cape uh, um, resources, you know, would that suddenly make sense to actually then have those uh, treated for you? Right. It would be, it would definitely be a consideration. Uh, that would definitely not be off the table. If, there, if, if a facility existed here that could crack and leach the material here, and there was, you know, again, hitting that last bullet point, there's a way to maximize shareholder value that direction. There's absolutely yeah. no reason why we shouldn't consider that. Thank you very much. Um, you've actually gained a bit of time on the schedule. We're sort of basically back um, on schedule just about. Uh, I don't see I never any... do that, by the way. So uh... <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> thank you. Thanks uh, to everyone. Okay. Thank to you then, Eric. Uh, I don't see any further hands. Maybe at, at this point, I, I need to uh, maybe give an, an overdue apology. Uh, we have actually a, a number of other... Uh, producers or project representatives um, participating here and I'm not giving everybody the opportunity to actually give a presentation it's simply for lack of time it's trying to strike a balance between getting uh, getting the scene set but but also doing it in a in a reasonable time um, and, um, <clears throat> I'm so I've, I've simply gone according to the results of the survey as to you know uh, which which companies people would would most like to see um, presentations from and that is how Stencom Scroll and, and Pronox came up um, on, on the top. So what I want to achieve with the rest of the program before the, the, the actual discussion is just um, to give more some of the background as to what is available, what is the, um, you know, in terms of my finance, in terms of um, laboratory facilities, in terms of, you know, um, legislative um, environment. Um, so that is why the next speaker that I'm inviting is uh, Sam from Mintec um, to just tell us about, um, you know, what we have locally available in terms of um, um, mineral, uh, uh, metallurgical uh, facilities. It's also not the only facility in the country that can, can offer uh, services, but, um, well, there's, here is one for you, um, just to also help to, um, to, to set the scene for what we have available in the region. Sam, can I hand over to you? Thank you, Petras. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sam Okwena. I'm a principal engineer at Mintech in the hydrometallurgy department. I uh, have to ask, can you see my screen? We can't see your screen as yet. Not yet, have Sam. You, have you started sharing? Let me... I have started sharing. Can you see it now? Yes, we can. There we go. That's perfect. Thank you. Okay. So, yes, uh, the, the topic for my discussion is uh, MinTech facilities. And I'm also going to show you uh, what we can do in terms of rare earth processing. Uh, to give a background about uh, MinTech, the company was established by the state in 1934, and it is still owned by the state, meaning that we are a parastatal. Our, our operations are guided by MinTech Act of 1989, which I can 
summarize as follows. To foster the establishment and expansion of industries in the field of minerals and products derived therefrom, to contribute to wealth creation and poverty alleviation, to develop the requisite human capital to sustain the mining and mineral sector. In terms of the vision, our vision is to be a leading partner in innovative innovative solutions for mineral solutions. And our mission is, is to lead research, development, and innovation, utilizing minerals to drive sustainable industry development and inclusive economic growth. Our, in terms of the workforce, Mintech employs about 550 people, whom between 250 to 300 are professionals with qualifications ranging from bachelor's degrees up to postdoctorate degrees. The company operates with an annual budget of about 500 million, which we get part of the budget from the state for our research and for other operations. Mintech's mandate on the mining value chain starts from the concentration stage up to post mining. Our sister companies, on the other hand, which is the Council for Geosciences and Council for Scientific and Industrial Research, uh, they do the exploration part of it. And as you can see with the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research, they, in principle, they do everything that MinTech does in addition to the mining aspect. Uh, the difference between what CSIR does and Mintech is that for Mintech, this part of the value chain from the concentration down to post mining is the core of Mintech's business. While CSIR has a broad business interest, which includes other aspects of engineering. So in my opinion, Mintech is, the, is superior in this part of the value chain. In this slide, I am going to, I have listed our REE capabilities, which I will elaborate further in the next slide. This includes chemical analysis, mineral characterization, REE extractions, REE purifications and recovery. Uh, chemical analysis are very important in any metallurgical operation. Before you can do anything to the ore or material. You need to know what is present in the material. So the fastest way to get information about the material itself is to do an XRF scan. And for more accurate results, we have instruments for that, which includes the ICPOES or MS. We have the ICPOES for MS is best for analyzing base metals and rare earth. We also have the ion chromatography and the local combustion instruments for fluoride, carbonate, and phosphate. I have to say that before the samples can be read with these instruments, they need to be proper, properly prepared, as I've indicated with the slide, with the picture on the, on the left there. So for, after completing the chemical analysis, the next step is to understand or know the ore minerals. Understanding the ore minerals will assist in selecting the right process for extracting the value metals. After preparing the ore, the X-ray diffraction is, uh, is used to read the, the ore minerals in the sample. In case of rare earth ore. It will reveal whether the rare earth minerals are monocyte, basnacite, oxidatime, etc. This will also give us an information on how to best extract value metals. The X-ray diffraction also can give us the type of gang minerals that are present in the ore. The, op the optical microscopy automated mineralogy 
electron probe, microanalyzer, and the scanning uh, electron microscope are all vital for producing information such as mineral proportions, the distribution of gray earth in the ore mineral, how minerals occur, whether they are finely disseminated or not, and also the deliberation of the minerals. This information will guide us on how to structure the flow sheet. It will give us an idea as to whether there is potential of rejecting gang minerals before value metal extraction processes. And also, and also give us an idea of potential extraction processes for the type of minerals present, whether it is monocyte or parsnasite. So REE are extracted using hydrometallurgy processes or <clears throat> a combination of hydrometallurgy and pyrometallurgy. Most rare earth minerals are extracted under very aggressive conditions. For example, uh, the hydrometallurgy process for extraction of rare earth from monocyte or pastasite, which are the dominant rare earth minerals, requires a minimum sodium hydroxide concentration of 50% percent in the lixiviant. This, this process is performed at 150 degrees Celsius, which is very aggressive. In terms of equipment, we have a five liter laboratory stainless steel reactor, which is equipped with instruments to handle the highly corrosive 50% sodium hydroxide, and also to achieve the 150 degrees Celsius temperature that is required. We also have uh, a two liter batch scale autoclave reactor for the same application. For bulk operations, we have a 200 liter stainless steel reactor, and we also have a four by 70 liter reactor cascade for continuous operation. A pyrometallurgy process for rare earth extractions are done in combination, as I, I indicated that they are done in combination with the hydrometallurgy uh, processes. The pyrometallurgy process converts the rare earth minerals from the insoluble compounds to either acid or water soluble compounds. So some of the processes include the acid bake, which where sulfuric acid is contacted with the ore and placed inside a furnace or passed through a Killing to convert insoluble rare earth to water soluble, soluble insoluble rare phosphate into acid, furnaces, and laboratory clean for both. And we also have larger killing and operations. Uh, to cure this machine, removing unwanted substances. The most common impurities are iron, aluminium, and thorium for monocyte ores. These impurities need to be removed before the rare earth solution can be subjected to further processing. The, our facility for rare earth uh, purification includes the bench scale, precipitation and redissolution reactors. And we also have continuous redissolution and precipitation reactor cascade. Uh, once the, 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 solu the rare earth containing solution has been purified satisfactorily, the solution is contacted with a suitable organic that can extract all the rare earth with the exception of lanthanum. Leaving lanthanum in the raffinate is also a form of separating the rare earth. So the, 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 the loaded organic is stripped uh, of the rare earth selectively, starting with the light rare earth, then the middle rare earth, 
and lastly the heavy rare air. Then the the pictures on the on the right show the, our facility that we have recently built for separating of solvent of of, of rare earth elements. So once the once the separate uh, rare earth uh, fractions have been stripped from the organic, they are then precipitated to their own. Rare earth fractions or product. Those precipitates are then calcined to produce high purity rare earth oxides. Uh, so, to conclude, I, I have shown that uh, Mintech has the instruments and equipment that are necessary for the development of REE processes. And I've also shown that we can do mineral characterization, extraction purification, and also recover rare earth as oxide fractions. And I've also shown that we have also done piloting on the Southern African ores. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sam. Um, questions? Anybody? I see Zitzer is first. Go ahead. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you very much, Sam, for a very uh, interesting presentation. I, I just want to ask a general question um, <clears throat> is whether we're going to get these uh, presentations circulated afterwards. Thanks. Yes, definitely. Uh, I think we'll send them to Petras. Petras will be able to distribute. Look, and um... Trevor has also indicated he has no problem sharing his. I don't know, Eric, about yours. Sorry, I was on mute there. Uh, I'll have to ask our in, uh, general counsel, but most of those slides are public data, so I don't think there's an issue. I just need to run it by. Sure, okay. Would be appreciated if you share whatever it is that you can share. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Um, Sam, um, okay, well, let me give this opportunity to Isaac first. A quick one, Sam, uh, Isaac again here. Um, what capacity, you know, is, is this uh, extraction plant? You know, I'm thinking uh, if one may have to start humbly by sourcing, that's just a pure sourcing. If you had an entrepreneur who would say, look, let me do a market and product development by just sourcing third party uh, concentrate and uh, passing it through your facility and separating this thing and uh, seeing that yes indeed we can make this what, what quantities well, can you produce with this uh, with your facility the uh, pilot facility uh, sam thank you oh thanks for the question isaac so the first Yes, so the facility is for piloting. So we can take uh, variable uh, variable quantities depending on, on on the quantity that we want to, to 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 pilot. So in terms of the value, we can add for the red earth uh, plant. We can take anything between five liters to twenty liters of solution per hour so that is what we are able it's for piloting so that we can uh, uh, generate design data out of the information that we get from this facility i think does it does it answer the question Yes, I think it does. Obviously, I think I was, uh, suppose it's a batch wise, you know, so you can do batches and, you know, you can uh, accumulate batches as you go along. Yeah, no, that's fine. But uh, 5,000 liters going up and all that. Yeah, it does. Thanks. Zitsa, you also have your hand up still or again? Yeah. <laughs> no, this is an again hand. Thanks, Patricia. Uh, <laughs> I um, yeah, just coming to the substance. Um, so the presentation that I had from Mintec uh, uh, a while ago, can't remember exactly when, um, was that you know the next step is to look at a, a doing a bankable bankable feasibility study 
And that was, I think, on the order of 250 million rand or something that it would uh, cost. Um, so I'm not, I, I'm sure that, uh, you know, the work that you've done will feed into that. But uh, is that my understanding of where Mantek is currently standing? This may come out of the question discussion, but I'm not sure I'm going to be here um, for that. Thanks. Uh, sorry, my net, my connection has been poor. There, I missed most part of the question. I don't know, Petras. Maybe can you repeat the question for me? Sorry, uh, Zita, can you maybe just repeat the question? Uh, better luck this time. My understanding was that Mintek, uh, the next step uh, for Mintek would have been to do a bankable feasibility study, or somebody to do a bankable feasibility study. Uh, that would cost about 250 million rand. Um, is that still the state status uh, from Mintek perspective? Thank you. Sam, do you want to say or shall I? Yeah, can you please maybe respond to that, Petras, because uh, my network is very poor here. Okay, okay. Yeah, you have been breaking up a bit, but fortunately we did get the gist of your presentation. Well, okay, look what I have to say, uh, um, you know, from what you're saying, you know, that that is actually part of what, what I think has led to this forum um, is, is, is was the prospect of, of that as a next step. But then one asks yourself, you know, Oh, is Mintek really in the right place to be doing such a study? Because what is the feed material coming in? Um, and, you know, sort of, it really depends on who is actually putting up a plant and, and running it. Um, and, and to a bankable feasibility study, it needs to be quite particular to a particular set of circumstances. Uh, you, you can't then still be talking about plus or minus 50 percent. You now need to start, um, you know, putting things really down hard. And, and that's not so easy to do. It's a, I don't want to say it is possible or sensible to try to do that if you don't even have one, a particular project in mind. To do a bank of feasibility study on, on a generic basis is sort of, you know, it, that doesn't make sense. Um, so, um, I, I, I wouldn't say a, a bankable feasibility study is, is on the cards for us immediately um, until there's actually a prospect for something more specific. Um, do, I, do I need to expand further or is, is, is that sort of really, you know, coming to the, to the heart of your question? No, that's sufficient. Thank you very much uh, for that, uh, Chair. Uh, Petrus, uh, perhaps to add on that, sorry, it's Isaac here. I think at the time well, when um, we... Look, Isaac, uh, do you want to actually just take the word? You are up next. Um, so um, maybe, yeah, lead in with that and actually give us um, whatever it is that you were going to share with us. Fantastic. Uh, the timing is right. Uh, thank you so much. <laughs> Uh, my name again, Isaac from the IDC. Uh, maybe I should uh, be a pick of myself here. Let me just see. Uh, let me just. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. Can you hear me? Can hear you and see you. No, fantastic. <laughs> Yeah, my, again, my name is Isaac from the IDC. I've been with the IDC almost 20 years now, uh, background uh, chemical engineer, uh, looking a lot more into the uh, mining and uh, beneficiation value chain, especially uh, specialty, uh, you know, minerals, uh, you know, organic uh, chemistry, as uh, Tronox uh, and uh, uh, Mintech and all that we are in this uh, value chain. Uh, particularly to rare earths. Uh, you know, we've been uh, looking at this uh, for many, many years. Uh, we've been talking to uh, the likes of Trevor for, for, for quite a while. We've, we've spoken to quite a few people in the industry uh, who've got some deposits and some dumps. Uh, looking at uh, finally, you know, uh, you know coming up uh, with a commercial operate, uh, operation in SA. 
Uh, we haven't been successful, but uh, I think, uh, look, uh, with the discussions and the negotiations, uh, we, we have moved the debate uh, somewhat. Uh, specifically about uh, the mean tech technology and uh, the envisaged, uh, you know, I'll say tall facility. I think at the time, you know, as the IDC, you know, we, we had pledged and uh, we are still pledging that uh, you know if we have to do the feasibility uh, for for that uh, exercise uh, you know idc can actually uh, participate in such a project in the feasibility studies up to about 60 percent of the funding and uh, and and actually uh, become an anchor you know investor eventually uh, if uh, you know we may need to invest in such a facility so obviously we are not an industry player. Uh, we we relying on the likes of yourselves, uh, Tronox. Uh, thanks again, Eric, uh, for a good presentation, and uh, and uh, and yourself, uh, Trevor. That uh, look uh, now with these electric vehicles, uh, permanent magnets, and everything coming up uh, with this uh, transition to the zero carbon economy. Uh, we are still very much uh, for. A local beneficiation and, uh, and, uh, and an operation here in SA. Uh, you know, it's as simple as that. Uh, we can't say more, as we just say, look, obviously, uh, we will be led by industry as to what we can do, but, uh, you know, with our mandate and role being that of industrial development, uh, we will be there for us. Uh, personally, myself, uh, Trevor knows quite well, uh, I am for uh, Earth and uh, uh, really, really, uh, I think uh, it's a huge opportunity with uh, all this uh, monocyte that is lying in Southern Africa and, uh, and, and hard rock mining uh, with uh, Stian Kamskra. We also have another opportunity in that area, which is also hard rock mining. Uh, we say, look, um, let's do something. Baby steps, uh, perhaps is better than a big bang. And uh, we will support it, uh, you know, ourselves uh, together with uh, MinTech being uh, state-owned uh, companies, technology and finance. Uh, it's likely there that you can come to the table and help whoever, a private enterprise, join forces and take it forward. Uh, that's all uh, that I want to say, uh, Petrus, and thanks for the opportunity uh, to allow me uh, the two minutes uh, to state IDC's case. Thank you. Sure, Isaac, uh, thank you very much. Um, I think it was uh, yeah, a, a short uh, presentation, but um, a vital one. I, I don't know if uh, everybody has already had the discussions with Isaac and his team, but um, uh, if not, now is an opportunity. I would expect, um, you know, at least I see Zitza's hands up. Um, you want to go, Zitza? Yes, thank you, uh, Petrus, and thank you, Isaac. Um, nice, nice to uh, nice to see you. Um, <clears throat> my question is just why, in all this many years, um, you know, we have not been able to get a landing on this thing. If I understand Trevor's presentation, it was, you know, based on the economics um, and that we, you know, the, the prices and and so it's just not uh, matching up. Um, but Isaac will be interested to hear if you, you have another perspective on, on what has been the challenge um, over the last 10 years. Thanks. Uh, look, uh, from our side, uh, as we say, look, uh, everything for you normally say follows finance at the end. You know, you need the, the, the pillars, you need the resource, you need uh, the conversion technology. You need to develop the markets for your product, uh, technology and that. Yeah, look, uh, I would say over the years, really, uh, first price was indeed that uh, you must have a resource. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, we place quite a bit of emphasis on, on what Stian Kamskral, as Trevor was uh, putting it up there, uh, you know, spearheading the whole thing. Put First, put your hand on the resource and then we can move. Uh, we did have a chat with other people, with uh, Rio Tinto at some point, also with uh, with uh, Tronox in those days. I think there was still uh, Exaro. We just say, look, first, I think uh, the challenge it was uh, first getting the resource, uh, all the licensing and everything that goes with it. 
and then we will move uh, with that process. And then that hasn't been the case. I think there's been back and forth, back and forth, uh, especially on Trevor's side with the Canadians coming in, uh, you know, that 500 million uh, back and forth, back and forth, that, that kind of thing. But the others, I think uh, the resources were a little bit other smaller. Uh, you know, I remember a company up in Tabazimbi and uh, and also in Palaburwa, uh, you know, in Fosco, where some, some guys wanted to extract uh, from the dams there a uh, light ray earths. Uh, I think uh, the concentrations were a little bit smaller. And hence, we just thought that perhaps uh, if Festian comes scroll with a very good grade, can have that first mover, the other school, uh, you know, you know, you, you, you know, handle uh, just weld a little bit on that. Yeah, I think I think that's it. But uh, all in all, we 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 we've raised our hands and say, look, uh, whoever can put a plan on the table, uh, we will look at it. And Mintech put uh, the technology a uh, plan on the table, and we say we will support this technology. Uh, you know, it be uh, truly uh, proudly South African. Yeah. Thanks. Can I ask maybe we, we have uh, several other uh, participants, representatives of other projects on the panel here and uh, um, they have been fairly quiet. Um, where, from from uh, any one of the other participants here, has there so far been anything that you've heard that you that you did not know before or anything that maybe is changing the um, likelihood of your own projects to, to go ahead um, or to change the way in which they might actually be steered in the future? I want, don't want to put anyone on the spot, but... Um, Johan Human, Ed Loy. Um. Can I offer a couple of comments there? This is Philip Kenny from Frontier. Okay, please. Um, <clears throat> look, I, I, I think the the um, <clears throat> the idea of a centralised refinery that could take feedstock from multiple places is is a is a great idea. I think the challenge is really. Um, the classic chicken and egg one um, <clears throat> and you know I, I, I think from a centralized refinery perspective the only way that that will get financed is by government putting up the money um, and of course the challenge for government to do that is going to be well let's say we build a refinery how do we know that the mines whether it be Steenkampskral or Frontier at Zankopstrift or the various other projects around Southern Africa can actually secure the funding um, and not to, and, and have the technical capability to put to put the, the project into production. Um, if, if on the other hand, the government says, well, we'll wait until those mines are put into production, then the, 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 the mining companies who are looking for finance will be asked by the financiers, where are you going to separate your product? And then you're back to the back, back, back to the beginning. Um, what I would point to really is, and this is only happening in the past couple of months, is we've seen um, Australia just, um, in fact, a couple of days ago, um, announce a significant government funding for a refinery. I think it is in fact for Luca, another mineral science producer that, um, that, that, that will and intends to um, crack its mineral science monazite and, and actually produce separated railroads. So that's the situation where the Australian government is going on risk for a very substantial amount of funding to do that. Um, uh, and expecting then the, the private sector companies with the with the resources to to build their part of the of the um, uh, supply chain out and, and deliver. Um, US is doing it on a small scale. Canada is now starting to do it. So look, I, 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 I think I think somebody needs to kickstart it. But ultimately, in my view, for any kind of centralized concept to work, government's probably got to be committed to take that risk up front and effectively say, build it and they will come. Um, and I don't know whether that 
capability or intent exists in, in South Africa. I think we and all the others would say, great idea, we'll sign up. If you build it, we'll deliver our, our material to you. Um, but it's who's going to move first and who's got the capital and, and can put it up. So I don't want, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm very positive about the idea, but like everything else, it's was post down to who's going to put up the money. And, and um, I think it would have to be the government to do that because the private sector won't put up for a multi, a multi source separation facility. What I would say just as a, as a final point, I mean, we, we've done a PFS on Zankop's drift um, and we actually took the view, this is back in 2015, we took the view that you had to have a route to market of being able to produce separated railroads. So we did in fact a, a pre-feasibility study, not just in building a mine at Zankop's drift, but also on putting a separation plant up at Saldana Bay. Um, so we do have a very good understanding of the of the capital and operating costs and, and, and the technology required to do so. Um, and um, that, that in its own right is very significant um, uh, as a separate exercise from, from what all of the, the mines would require to, to produce a, a, um, uh, a mix for a product to, to begin with. So those are my comments if that's of any value. Well, look, that's of, of, of very much value and it is actually getting, you know, starting to get really to the heart of the discussion I think we, we ought to be having. Um, in a moment, we can be asking um, Kajiso of the DMRE about the um, appetite uh, of, of, of Treasury at this stage uh, for another state-owned enterprise. But before I do that, maybe just Isaac can, can comment, I suppose, probably as the, as the closest to what one could come to a, to a state-backed um, funder, um, you know, is, is that, does that ring true with you? What Philip has just said, how do, how do you, is that your view as well? Uh, yes, Petras, yeah, I think uh, uh, Philip is uh, making a good point uh, and in, in, in indeed, uh, you know, is something that uh, I think uh, merit uh, us to explore further. Uh, obviously, when you talk about the state, uh, look, uh, we, we, we are the state, we are the arm of the state, uh, you know, D DMR, I'm sure, uh, you know, is a, uh, there's policy, uh, there, are our, there are our principles giving us policy, but in implementation, I, it, it will, at the end of the day, it will come to the IDC, a national treasury will point it out to the IDC as an industrial corporation. Uh, my sense, uh, you know, if uh, just high level way to, uh, to, to, to think about it. I will say what is very key in this thing is that yes, if we as uh, ourselves, uh, perhaps with the technology from yourselves, have to put up the refinery, yes, uh, obviously on the back of uh, you know MOUs or MOIs, uh, you know, uh, you know, in terms of uh, who will supply into into that, you know, from the mines, yeah, just collate those volumes and just see, look, uh, potentially if you have everything else equal, the testing and then everything, and then uh, the mines in the meantime could, uh, you know, like Trevor is got uh, his uh, resource uh, outlined, they, we know how much is there, that's fine. Then we can scope uh, nameplate capacity and all that. I think what is very key with that another point, obviously uh, you, we may need uh, an industrial partner. Just to say guys, if you put it up, you have to indicate uh, economic merit, at least in the sense that, uh, you know, you could develop a market, uh, perhaps uh, one or two, uh, you know, industrial partners who are well placed uh, to do the market that can do. And then I would think, uh, you know, from the licensing and everything else, uh, you know, where do you put up this thing? Uh, that's very important with that NNR licensing and Thorium story and stuff. Uh, which, uh, you know, like you would, uh, you know, you, you will need a place like uh, Stiencamp Scrap, perhaps to put it up, or I don't know, Philip, uh, if you've got a site in uh, wherever, you know, somewhere you put it up. But yes, it's, 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 it's something very, uh, I'll say, doable to look at uh, IDC uh, being the anchor, uh, you know, perhaps putting uh, may perhaps, uh, you know, the, the bulk of the funding towards that, uh, you know, to get it up and running. But we will still need, uh, you know, just a partner skin in the game, maybe 20%, 10% at least, 
uh, who will bring in the technical aspects, uh, the market aspects uh, thereof. Yeah, it's doable. I think it's worth uh, exploring further. Thank you. Thank you, Isaac. Now we are already getting uh, a little bit into the the forum discussion that we that we reserved for this afternoon. So, I would, uh, but what you have been saying, and thanks, Philip and Isaac, for setting the scene. I think we would. This is probably where we would want to 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 take the conversation further um, after the break. Um, so, thank you very much for that. Can we give quickly hand over to Zitzer um, to to give us his presentation? If we if you see us going a little bit over the intended time, we can shave it off the the break. Um, you know, so it's it's not a crisis. Uh, but Zitzer, can you lead us, please? Can I just confirm that uh, everybody can see the the slides? Yes, we can see your slides. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, um, Beatrice, and also good afternoon to all the other colleagues. Um, I've got one major disadvantage in this conversation and at the same time very much an advantage, and that is that I haven't been involved in this decades of discussion around what should be done and in terms of the, the, the rare earths. I have been to Stiengam's Kral, uh, we really generously were able to meet, uh, to, to go underground there. Um, but the, this discussion about South Africa um, producing rare earths and exporting rare earths, I haven't been party to those discussions. So I think, in, as I say, in some respects, it's a disadvantage. So I don't know all the detail and the context and all of that. Um, I think on the other hand, it is an advantage that I, you know, I, for me, it seems as though there is really good opportunities and um, it is very important um, for us, which I'll describe in a moment why, why that is. Um, so, um, yeah, I think thank you very much for, for establishing this forum. Um, very, very useful. So from the Minerals Council side, um, so I'm responsible for modernization and, and safety. And we're really looking at the, uh, at the mine of the future and, and, and how mining would in the, in the future take, uh, take place. So we always, I always position this as, you know, the, the, the world, all of us to have a better world, we need innovation, whether it's in terms of climate change or poverty or water, all those things need innovation to, to actually improve um, the situation. So that is no question that the innovation needs mining. Um, you know, we often sit in forums where people um, are very much against, against mining and say that we should discontinue mining. Um, but meantime, you know, the people who wear jewelry and they also have mobile phones and, and all of that. So just to put that uh, perspective, we you know, we looked at the, 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 if you just look at the mobile phone, Trevor spoke about it earlier, I'm sure you all very well familiar with it. But this is what I do when I talk to other people about, um, you know, rare earths and, and the potential in terms of that, is that this is, you know, fundamentally necessary to, the, to our own future and a better future for, for our kids and, and grand, grand uh, kids. So, I think the, from our side, the key points that I wanted to make is, you know, in terms of the demand and supply considerations that we, the limited exposure that we have, uh, have had to it. On the demand side, you know, we've been in conversations with the US and with EU, and they all have on their list of crit critical um, minerals, they have, um, you know, that on their list, uh, the rare earths. And, They've also articulated that their willingness to invest um, in mining and mining infrastructure for, uh, for security reasons. Now, you know, how many conversations have been had around these things, I don't know. Um, but this is just what I see as somebody who's uh, just been looking at it, um, you know, uh, at, at the level that is, is early stage, if I can call it that way. 
Then in terms of the supply side, so we were familiar that there were certain of these, uh, these things, um, you know, that being considered as discussed before, and what's very useful to get the perspectives of other, other colleagues. <clears throat> and we just say on the supply side, um, you know, if there are options to make the, 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 the extraction of rare earths viable in, in South Africa, you know, um, we think that they, those issues should be seriously explored. And I mean, we've got some good examples in South Africa on gold. The Rand refinery was established by the cha then Chamber of Mines, uh, which is now the Minerals Council. And then on uranium, we have NAFCOR, which was also a centralized facility to which different mines and mining companies provided their material and it was uh, extracted in that, uh, in that central facility. So what is it that the Minerals Council can bring to the debate? So one is we've got a very long um, institutional memory. So the organization is 134 years old. So in terms of learning, in terms of how our refinery worked, NAFCOR and all those things, you know, there's, there's a lot of things that are either now archives or otherwise still people having knowledge about those, uh, those things. Um, the other thing is we're an advocacy body um, on behalf of the mining companies. And, you know, I think our CEO has, uh, his name is Roger Baxter, but he has now got a second name, which is Frank. He's been very frank with, uh, you know, all stakeholders and so, you know, these are the things that we need to, to put in place to, to hashtag making mining matter, which is our, our purpose. Um, so that, uh, you know, that is one, one uh, opportunity. I, the, 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 in this whole sequence of presentations, which I found very interesting, the one, one thing where I found a shiver down my spine when somebody mentioned this as a SOE, we are at the moment, with ESCOM and Trustnet, most of it, you know, spend most of our time there to try and get, you know, things uh, working there so that we can benefit from, you know, the high commodity prices that we, we have, but it is very challenging. And just this morning we were, uh, you know, we received a letter um, from a Denel, uh, a company that's within the Denel stable and is performing very well, it's producing lead azite, which you may know better about than, than I do, but it's a critical component of detonators. And if you, if you stop that, you can paralyze the whole mining industry, which is very much dependent on blasting. And you could at the same time, you know, close local manufacturing capacity and lose another thousand plus jobs, which is certainly not something that we, we're looking at. So this is now taking us to Denel, um, and we don't know what is going to come next. So definitely when it comes to SOEs, uh, it is going to be very difficult to, to, you know, for us to support that. Um, we, perf uh, you know, we have the view that we need to try and see how can we unlock private sector um, capability. And so in terms of the view that was expressed, um, you know, that, that the government need to come in for the funding, you know, it is, uh, it is going to be a challenge because of the, the fiscal constraints. I think government recognizes well that, that mining has really bailed out the country you know, and throughout this COVID-19, uh, thanks, you know, thanks goodness for the, for the higher commodity uh, prices and, and so on. So, um, you know, I, I think, you know, we, our main scheme is just, um, I think we need to explore these options. Um, we're happy to be part of those conversations. We see it very much important for the innovation, modernization of the, you know, world and, and for the future, of, of, of uh, humanity. So, uh, and, and we've got, I think, knowledge and, and um, advocacy uh, convening authority and so on that, that could, uh, could assist in this, uh, this process. So that's as far as I can go today, um, um, Beatrice. So thank you very much for the opportunity and look forward to, to some of the discussion. Thank you.
Zitsa, thank you very much. And um, apologies so long to Kahisu, who's next. Uh, we've been eating into your time, but I think the thread of the conversation has been uh, leading up perfectly to uh, to sort of um, basically um, have everybody in suspension to hear what the uh, view would be from the from the, the side of the, the DMRE. But uh, just before we hand over to, to Kahiso, well, let me just see if there are questions uh, for Zitsa directly on his presentation. Of, um, if not, then um, Isaac. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a comment. Uh, obviously, uh, he raised uh, the issue with the state uh, pioneering the whole thing, uh, which uh, I will also have the same comments. But as I said, you know, we are the industrial arm of the state and uh, we have done industrial projects and I'm sure uh, that is well known as IDC. And we, we are self-funding. We are not, we're not uh, by the way, just, just to uh, state it again, we, we, we're not depending on national treasury to fund our own projects. Uh, we, we have a 140 billion uh, balance sheet, which is uh, only 6% geared. Uh, it's a very lazy balance sheet, to be honest. Uh, we raise money on international markets and, uh, you know, IDC's role is well known. So uh, for something like this, if it's spearheaded by the IDC, you know that uh, the, the model that we follow is a corporate model. It's a purely, purely private sector corporate model. That's why I say, look, uh, you have uh, the government uh, supporting it, uh, DMR and all other departments and all that, but uh, the implementation thereof is from the IDC, which is a which is a project finance model. Uh, to be honest, yeah. So, so yeah. if we do, if if we do it, we will take equity in it as the IDC on the strength of the IDC balance sheet. Uh, so, yeah. So so the fear about government and uh, SOE and all that uh, it doesn't apply to the IDC. Uh, we have proven over seventy five years that we we are a, we are a global player. Thank you. Isaac, thank you very much. Um, now, I don't want to keep Kahiso waiting any longer, so uh, please would you um, share with us your screen and, and take us through your presentation? Um, thank you, thank you, sir. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, <clears throat> I think I just want to... I want to skip towards the end of my presentation because um, listening to the conversation, but first let me check, uh, is my screen visible? You can see it, it is just not in presentation mode. Okay. Should be in there presentation mode. All right, thank you very much. Um, I think listening to the conversations, I had a presentation talking about the policy basis of uh, uh, mineral beneficiation, justifying why we need mineral beneficiation, but having listened to the conversations, I think if you will allow me, uh, Dr. Petrus, if I can just keep cut to the chase to the elements of my presentation that I think uh, would be relevant to the discussions uh, since we've uh, narrowed down to talking about um, uh, a, a refinery, a rare earths refinery. So uh, if it's okay by you, uh, I'll just drill down into the types of interventions that we at the DMRE we are looking at to try and promote beneficiation. Would that be okay? Yeah, no, yeah, no, 100%. All right, thank you very much. So um, I'll quickly run through the part where we talk about the beneficiation strategy because um, these interventions currently, um, <clears throat> they are still under discussion in the department. We are still looking at, uh, so in the past what happened is that we had the beneficiation strategy which was adopted as a policy in 2011. And in the strategy, we identified two key areas with, uh, within which we could uh, promote uh, local industrialization. The first one was um, ensuring that the security of supply for the minerals. Uh, so we wanted to make sure that domestic, uh, those that add value to the minerals domestically had security of mineral supply. And we were looking at section 26 of the NPRDA. Uh, there was also the, uh, 
mining charter which looked at creating demand for those things that are beneficiated locally to be used um, in, in, in the mining industry. Uh, as Sidze uh, alluded to earlier, we always believe that um, mining is a critical element of the economy and being such a critical element, it can also be a driver uh, for domestic beneficiation. Now, in terms of the other interventions that we looked at, uh, that we worked on uh, over the past uh, three years, uh, one of them is the long-term pricing uh, agreement on electricity. This is an attempt to try and address uh, the issue of uh, rising electricity prices. Um, it gives uh, those that qualify a discounted electricity price I believe this would be, I'm not sure how relevant it would be to the proposed uh, uh, refinery, central refinery, but it could be one of the things that uh, could assist in making the project feasible. Uh, there's also the element of own uh, generation up to 100 megawatts, the legislation was changed. And there's also other amendments to the Electricity Regulation Act uh, that are looking to encourage uh, own generation such that uh, we alleviate uh, the current electricity problems that we have in the country. In terms of the other programs that we are looking at, uh, there's the Economic Recovery and Reconstruction Program that was launched by the president last year. Key amongst it in terms of support for local value, uh, value addition is the localization and uh, mineral uh, value addition. In terms of this work, what we are looking at currently is we are developing a mineral beneficiation master plan. But what will be more relevant to this discussion is uh, what will follow the development of the master plan. The master plan simply identifies the cross-cutting problems and looks to develop solutions to those problems. However, following that, uh, we will be looking at individual value chains to see how do we leverage our mineral resource well to create an industrial base as Isaac has been uh, talking about, which I think it's one of the critical, uh, the, the key functions of IDC. And another element that I believe is relevant and some of these programs don't necessarily reside in the, ID, in the DMRE, they reside by the way in uh, the DTIC so one of the elements that we are looking at that I believe would be relevant to this discussion is uh, the issue of the special economic zones. Now, uh, looking at the location of some of the mines, I would say uh, a relevant SEZ, there are existing SEZs. There's one that's in the Northern Cape, uh, near the, there's a corridor. Uh, that goes from, uh, I forget the name's place, where there's zinc mining, all the way to Bukhubai, where there's gonna be copper mining. Uh, and within that special economic zone, there will be zinc refining. Uh, they are looking at also a sulfuric acid plant, which would be a byproduct of the zinc refining. So uh, there could be an opportunity maybe to locate it there, in terms of what are the benefits of the special economic zone, you are looking at a preferential uh, tax rate of about 15%. Uh, you get tax relief as an employment incentive and also a building allowance for, 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 for those that operate within the special economic zone. So if this uh, refinery is gonna be located within a special economic zone, already there are these benefits that could um, contribute to making the project feasible. Also in terms of other existing uh, programs of, of state uh, that are administered by the DTIC in this case, uh, you have the critical infrastructure program. It helps with uh, the financing of uh, the infrastructure needs of a project. Uh, it's a grant of uh, about 10 to 30% of the infrastructure development costs that the project will need. And in cases where there's uh, water, uh, where water or electricity dependency on the grid is alleviated, so you're going off grid, 
um, you can qualify for up to 50% uh, of the development infrastructure development costs being covered by this critical infrastructure program. Uh, the maximum grant in this case, you are looking at about 50 million. In terms of the next one, you have also the capital projects feasibility program. Earlier, I think there was a discussion on uh, the feasibility, doing a feasibility study uh, by Mintech on this uh, um, project. So you have the capital project feasibility program. Um, it has uh, a cap of about 8 million rands. I think between DTIC and IDC, there could be, uh, I'm not sure how much funding is required for Mintech, but uh, there could be a sizable portion contributed by the state there. The grant uh, is about 50% uh, of, um, of the total study costs. And uh, the, the project need not be located in South Africa, only it can be located in the SADC region. Um, <clears throat> there's also, of course, uh, related, closely related to that, the issue of designation. So for all infrastructure programs, um, what National Treasury and the DTIC do is they designate certain pro uh, products as being, uh, as having a certain amount of as needing to have a certain amount of local content. Um, the legislation, unfortunately, currently is being challenged. So maybe we don't need to focus on this, but I believe these four programs could uh, uh, contribute uh, greatly to the discussions. And what I also wanted to propose as the discussions were going on was that maybe we also need to look to bring in uh, the DTIC into these uh, discussions, into this forum. Um, and another thing is that uh, there was an issue raised of uh, who will supply this refinery. There is this uh, Africa Exploration and Finance Corporation. Uh, they are a state-owned entity, uh, they are doing mining. Uh, they also could be asked uh, what role they could play in ensuring that this uh, refinery uh, becomes a success in terms of supply to, 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 to the refinery. Uh, yeah, that's basically it in terms of my presentation, the, the elements that I feel are relevant uh, to these discussions. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and at least to me, it's been uh, very interesting to see the points that you've mentioned. I think the, 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 the zone you were talking about is there around uh, Achenais, Black Mountain and, and Hamsburg. Um, yes, 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 yes. As, as for whether they are close to the um, rare earth areas, of course, in Northern Cape uh, standards, uh, something that's just around the corner is about 700 kilometers away. So I, I don't, I'm not sure, um, you know, sort of how um, close they are to that um, region. How how strictly are those borders drawn of the development zones that you that you have in mind? Mm, I'm not quite sure how strictly those borders are. Um, it's something that I could find out from the DTIC just how strict they are. Uh, but there are other uh, special economic zones, it's just that I'm not sure how far are they from the, from the project. There's one in Atlantis and Saldana. Uh, I, I don't have a sense of how far those yeah. would be from the project. Look, it's, it's, um, we've, we, we are pretty close to, to being on schedule, but... Um, can I ask that we take a 15 minute break? Um, so that would uh, put us back on schedule. Um, by all means, go and get a cup of coffee, but also um, ponder the questions that you have to ask um, of the rest of the panel. And um, I'm also hoping to get, um, you know, to give an opportunity to, to some of the other members in attendance to also that we can, um, hear yeah, their views. Um, well, Isaac, you want to say something before we break? 
Uh, yes, please. Uh, yeah, uh, thanks uh, for the discussions. Unfortunately, I'll be uh, getting off from here. I've got another uh, engagement. Uh, I'm driving to towards the airport now. Uh, yeah, my inputs, I think everybody has my inputs and uh, we will be available as the IDC uh, for whatever step uh, that the forum wants to take. But I would like to engage, uh, you know, most uh, firstly with the uh, with Mintech further and uh, and and just see if perhaps uh, there couldn't be a, a value proposition from look here's the technology want to commercialize this technology and uh, here's fire uh, perhaps a bit of finance or study something and then we can talk to uh, the private partners around the table here but either way the way that uh, you know you know we it might uh, progress going forward uh, we can be sure that the idc one or the other will participate Thank you so much. I have to rush. I will be looking for these presentations and then I will, the minutes and everything, and then I can latch on to that one. Thank sure, you so understood much. Tim, and, and thank you very much. It's much appreciated, Isaac. I don't know. Yeah, I know there's a couple of other people uh, with a similar situation. Zitza, I think you also, and I see. Yeah, no, I can still uh, participate in the first part of the discussion. I just have a specific comment uh, regarding the, the very useful presentation from the DMRE. Kahisu, thank you very much. Um, I think very useful to know that. I think, uh, I mean, we're clearly looking at where, where is the common ground here between all the parties uh, represented. Yeah. And I, I just want to agree with uh, Kahisu that you know, let's let's focus on the things that will incentivize, um, you know, IDC private sector participation, and not, you know, with the things that uh, we don't come with uh, with sticks like the designation approach and and all of that. Um, if the economics add up and we can find a mechanism to to fund that, um, you know, that uh, that I think will be the preferred preferred uh, approach. Um, so I think all those other four that uh, Kahisu had on the list, um, those are clearly falling in that category. And I agree that the designation one, um, you know, I think this is just going to divide us uh, rather than take it forward. Thanks. Thanks. It's uh, uh, Sydney. Sydney Martin, you wanted to say something? Uh, yes, I was saying thanks, Petrus. Uh, I don't know if Isaac is still on. Yeah, I see him still on. I, whether he's still listening, I, well, he hasn't yes, logged off. <laughs> For five minutes, yeah, Sydney. Yes, uh, Isaac, uh, good to uh, hear from you again uh, after a while. Um, just before you uh, leave, um, just want to touch on something that you mentioned earlier, um, and that was making it truly South African. Um, yeah, just maybe for us to just agree on the semantics, the uh, reason why we've sort of come here is to hopefully try and now start calling it truly Southern African, um, because yeah, the directive we're going is to just try and make it all inclusive outside South Africa, including us here in Namibia. But it's something that we'll also discuss further when we go into the uh, discussion session. But I thought I'll just bring that to your attention before you leave. No, thanks. 100%. Yeah, Sydney, I think we did have uh, some discussion with your team at some point. Yeah, 100%. Sedek, uh, you know, Ganga Mkunde, they say heavy uh, REEs in there, you know, Malawi and all these places. Yeah, so we look at it uh, holistically. Thank you so much. Okay, thanks, everybody. Look, okay. our 20 minute break has now shrunk a little bit to a 10 minute break. Um, so if we can all be back in about 10 minutes. Um, still uh, hope we really give you enough time to boil the kettle so um okay we we see you again in 10 minutes thank you Petrus. thank you
Okay, it is 10 to 3 local time, uh, according to my, my watch. Hopefully you can take your seats again. I trust that there is somebody on the other side of the uh, communication channel. Yes, we are. Yes, yes, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Good. I must say, um, I'm I'm very encouraged um, by what I have heard so far. I hope you share the sentiment. Um, <clears throat> um, it has exceeded my expectations in in some ways. Um, now. Let me just first of all hear from, uh, we, we have been going through it all a little bit snappily, um, whether there are any outstanding questions that anybody has for any of the uh, speakers that we had this morning. Um, doesn't seem to be any takers for that. Um, now, as I said, we, we have a few other uh, participants, or other, other projects under development of who are being represented here, and, and we have not heard from anybody. Um, just another opportunity for, for anybody who wishes to um, share with us anything about their project, um, in no particular order, not to put you on the spot, really, but, um, for example, Ed Loy of eTech, um, Anybody from Rainbow um, Minerals? Anybody? From, I, I don't know if we have anybody um, from Glenover in the end here. You got Ed here. I'm happy to say some words. Ed, please. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. Um, obviously, I was out um, at Mintech uh, back in November last year, which was a very enlightening meeting. Um, just to introduce myself to everyone else listening, I'm the founder and chief scientific officer of eTech Resources. We are developing the Eureka Carbonatite in central Namibia. Now, um, we're targeting, we've heard about monazite a lot today, obviously a well-known conventional ore. Um, but of course, what's important, and I'm so glad this always gets um, brought up when I'm talking to um, Southern African uh, Council like this, is that we're open about these issues. And it's important, if you're serious about production, you have to talk about these elephants in the room. <clears throat> and one of them is the radionuclei content, you know, Yes, monazite is easily crackable as a phosphate and has been a um, uh, host for rare earth oxides for many decades. Obviously, famously uh, at uh, Steenkrum's Kral, we've heard from, uh, and that's fantastic. Um, so, yes, we're in Namibia, obviously a uh, member of the SADC. Uh, we hear a lot about the geopolitical tensions in the world today. I think we all know the fact that there is this drive for diversification of supply. Um, we hear about uh, centralized tolling plants in Australia, in USA, in Canada. But of course, some of the best near term rare earth projects are situated in SADC countries. And in a world where shipping costs are getting higher and higher, Obviously, there's financial institutions that take on board ESG principles and the fact that they don't necessarily see the, um, uh, they wouldn't support, uh, you know, shipping concentrates halfway across the world for processing. There is such a need and it, it's a no brainer that it should, we should explore um, the tolling facilities that could be done um, in, in, in South Africa. Now, of course, one of the issues that we have um, is the fact that we are um, targeting monazite. Yes, we've already concentrated it with simple physical beneficiation and what have you. And of course, there's lots of other monazites around in the form of mineral sands, but not all monazites are the same. Of course, yes, they can, on the whole, uh, when concentrated, uh, can end up being class seven uh, naturally occurring radioactive materials that need special hand handling and special licensing. 
um, which obviously for us, um, obviously we have lots of uh, legislation when it comes to shipping cross-border, even though we have a monazite that is an order of magnitude less than a mineral sand monazite, for example. And the same goes for other monazites. For example, I'll just pick um, Kankun Kunde in Malawi. That would be a monazite concentrate that would actually be registering below class seven. But at the same time, a lot of these materials, even if they are low thorium content, when they are concentrated, uh, when they are processed, sorry, you are going to have um, radionuclide off um, <clears throat> uh, residues. You know, your technically enhanced naturally occurring radioactive materials that's going to need careful management. Now, we do know that obviously um, South Africa has very um, uh, firm and yet transparent um, radionuclide content um, <clears throat> legislation, and um, that's great. But this is the thing. We all talk about the fact that a centralized um, uh, processing hub would need a lot of uh, finance and preferably from uh, the state, like um, analog propositions from in Australia and Canada. But it's not just finance, it's also permitting. And this brings me back to the kind of thorium issue. Are we prepared um, for that legacy? Of course, if you are going to be tolling different monazites from all over the region, they're going to vary in thorium content. But, you know, there needs to be this conversation with stakeholders that if there is going to be a tolling plan, are the um, stakeholders involved um, prepared to have that legacy um, waste? Um, and I think that's something that we should continue to kind of discuss if we are going to be serious about um, bringing this forward. Thank you. <clears throat> Very important point, right? Um, thank you. I don't know if there's any immediate response to that, but um, for now, at least something that we that we need to add in the margin and and, and keep a note of as we as we keep on discussing. While we um, thinking can we also give an opportunity to Dr. Dion uh, Kemp um, actually also on the topic um, of radionuclides he's from the thorium network um, Dion are you there? Uh, yes I am and uh, actually Ed, I'm gonna discuss that uh, I can if, if you would like to I'm gonna share my screen because I'll give you guys a presentation of what we at the thorium network are actually doing at the moment. Can everybody see my slide? Can yes, we can, thank you. Excellent. Uh, my name is uh, Dian Kemp. I work for the Thorium Network as the Chief Nuclear and Chemical Engineer. The Thorium Network, in a nutshell, is a Swiss-based organization, and our main goal is to bring thorium and molten salt burnish to market. And that, and that is also where the, the question of the thorium uh, that Ed was talking about is coming on. We want that thorium because we want to use it for nuclear power. Now, bringing it back to this discussion, we developed two technologies. One is called PAD, one is called PATRAC. And as my bylaw says, we eliminate a lot of the waste and reduce the costs of producing rare earth elements. Now, we all know where rare earth elements are coming from. And we all know that if we do work with this stuff, it's very damaging to the environment. Anybody can go and look at what's happening in China at the moment. And we've got mines uh, such as those in the US, which have been shut down because of environmental issues. And even uh, things happening in other countries that are very devastating. Our technology is basically a two-pronged attack. The first one on the left is we utilize a high energy, high temperature plasma source, about 10,000 degrees Celsius, right there in the center of the flame. And the next one is what we call protract, which is membrane separation. And it's, in a nutshell, it's an advanced form of solid extraction. What does this do for us? Well, let's go into a little bit on how we produce it. 
Um, when our friend from Mintech, I'm sorry, I, I think it's Sam. I can't remember what your name is. This is basically the steps that we were discussing on how to beneficiate it. You benefit, you digest it in a very hot acid or acid bake or alkaline bake or something very really hard. And then you do the separation using all kinds of different things. And we saw pictures of his facility at Mintech, which was quite large, but very low volume. And what we, and also what comes from this is the large volumes of acid waste, radioactive waste, all kinds of other stuff that we have to, to handle. And finally on the right, you get your rare earths. This is where we come in. Our digestion is changed to pad. And we're talking the plasma and then getting the, the rare earth oxides into solution in under five minutes. From monazite to your solution, five minutes. And our patrat system, like I said, it's advanced form of salmon extraction. You actually reduce the number of stages and you, you reduce the size of everything tremendously. Your surface area is something like 500 times uh, more per meter square. And I'm not gonna go into too much detail, but the material that comes from the, from the plasma we actually have the ability to convert more of the minerals that are trapped in the ore, stuff like your aluminium, your vanadium, your molybdenum, into a uh, digestible product. And you can actually uh, separate it downstream and sell that for revenue. But that's a little bit beyond our, our capabilities. But we have that option. And also, uh, this technology actually also even allows us to work with other uh, minerals such as zircon, which will allow us to extract the zirconium and the hafnium from that, which is another high value metal. Let's talk a bit about the costs. On a CAPEX side, uh, using digestion, we estimate that our pad is about 1.2 times less. And this is where the cap, this is where the interesting thing comes from the solvent extraction. Using Petract, we've reduced the CAPEX by about 15 times. So from the IDC's perspective, the funding of this is gonna be significant, we're gonna get a significant more bang for our buck. Uh, everybody always wants to know about the OPEX side. While on the digestion, the values that we got from the US, we're looking at roughly $30 a kilogram just to digest it and get it in solution. We can bring it down to $2.50 and this includes electricity, purge gas, hydrochloric acid, but only once through, I haven't included regeneration. So this value can go even lower than what this is. The separation is 33% less than what we have with conventional SX. That's why we can bring our costs down from $40, which is typical, down to about $9.14, and we can probably even bring it lower. Just for those who are interested in saying, yes, please get it to us now. Looking at about 100,000 uh, euros for a 30 kilogram pan and protract full stream analysis. We've already got one client who is looking at this, actually two. And from that, we'll give you an audit analysis. The pilot plant will depend on, like everybody said, every monocyte is different. It's different to how everything is going. So that's why there's a big funky value of X million in there. And then we can bring it down to a commercial plant, which is designed by a full engineering house. Everything from putting the concentrate into the plasma all the way to final rare earth oxides. And from there, it's your market to go off and sell it. Just to quickly wrap up, our plan per track reduces the capex. Energy costs of the plasma, believe it or not, it's only 7% of conventional processing. Our acid is reduced. The reason I can say that is because we only use as much acid as what we need to digest the rear of oxides. We don't need to go in excess as what other processes have to do. That reduces our waste. Like I said, our OPEX is reduced by 30%, overall reduction 75% of OPEX. I can continue on with this, but like I said, you can read this, but here's the very nice thing. It's also modular. We can, go, we can increase it by a step-by-step -step process and give everybody a chance just to build up. So once we've got that uh, depository or that refi central refinery, 
as we bring in more mines in, we can just simply increase it. It doesn't have to include a massive redesign of the entire plant. Anybody is looking for my contact details, I'm gonna leave this for one second. So everybody can just quickly take a picture of that. Please contact me, I'm here in South Africa. I'm actually in Benoni and I would love to come and talk with everybody. Thanks a lot. Any questions? Thanks, Dian. Um, one question I have, um, in terms of um, um, proven technology and, and um, references, I don't suppose there's, there's any of it actually in operation, but has, has it been proven up to any particular scale you can share with us? Well, to answer your first question, there are the, everything that we're talking about is already in operation. So everything can be tested today. Um, the plasma, uh, people have been building plasmas for decades and we've got uh, uh, operations on that. On a commercial side, we are working on a plasma design with, of, um, of Nexa, who was running at 100 kilograms per hour. Um, that is a small, that is a, a commercial sized unit. And we're just gonna be build, putting a number of these next to each other to build it. We've got a technology partner who is gonna uh, optimize the plasma a little bit to make it more easier to do everything. The protraction, uh, that technology is also proven because the, the basic way of the technology, the basic technology has already been in use for all kinds of technology like uh, desalination, filtration, uh, microfiltration, etc. So that technology is well established. The only difference is we're just using it for something a little bit different. It's kind of taking uh, your microwave today, I'm eating food tomorrow, I'm eating a cup of coffee. I'm just using it for a different type of technology. Uh, Greg, I see yeah. you've got a question. Hardware and the plant works just need to test my rock. Whether my tell why my rock works in your process, hence the rock. <laughs> rock you like and the play. rock and play values. <laughs> Any other questions? Any Anybody questions? Else? Thank you. Okay, we, we, we're probably going to come, come back to this. Um, Dion, thanks. Um, if, if I can come back to, to, to Trevor and Eric, who presented earlier, from all that has been said today, um, is there anything that is, well, A, new to you, or, and, and anything B, that, that changes anything about the way you think um, you, would, you would take things forward? Um, anything that would make things easier? Um, Trevor, first of all. Hmm. Thank you for, um, for asking. Um, I think what I'm taking away from here is a greater sense of enthusiasm and commitment, inspiration. Um, having been um, like uh, wandering around in the wilderness for, for some years uh, in the past, uh, the, now the interest in rare earths has grown uh, tremendously. The demand for rare earths in the markets has grown tremendously. The technologies have developed. Um, that cell phone example was, it was enlightening. So um, I thank you all for raising us to a higher level of um, inspiration and commitment to fulfilling these projects. Thanks, and, and, and Eric from your side, Eric still has, did Eric have to ring off? I think Eric has gone, okay. Right. Um, now, yeah, as, as, as Trevor has said, it's also, my impression that I have not heard any objections, for example, 
to, if I may summarize, I, I have not any, I've not heard any objection to, for example, a collaborative effort to eventually work towards a centralized facility. I, I have not heard any objection of collaboration in principle, at least. Um, I don't know, uh, have I missed anything? As, uh, is there anybody who, who wishes to disagree? Is it so? I don't want to disagree, um, <laughs> Peter. I want to agree with you, and I would just want to build on what Trevor has said. And uh, I mean, I know he's been involved in it for a very, very long time. Um, I mean, I agree that I haven't heard anything that, um, you know, that, that's sort of in principle against us uh, pursuing this option further. Um, I think there are, you know, certainly what I've understood is there's, there's a lot of changes that have been happening in the marketplace, which now puts us in a much more favorable position to consider something like, uh, like this. So I think the, what Trevor calls the inspiration and enthusiasm is an extremely important part, um, because that, that is what normally drives, uh, you know, these, uh, these things towards something concrete that will be, be happening. I mean, including the regulator. I mean, I, I you know, as I said, when, when it comes to um, things like uh, designation and so on, we would prefer that we don't have to go there. That one rather looks at what is the incentives and incentivize and fuel this inspiration and, and so on that is here. So, as I said, I haven't been involved in these things, so maybe I'm going to oversimplify it, but um, to take it from means it comes. If you look in terms of a resource, um, you know, the, for me, the obvious one is the stranded monazite, um, you know, that is already available. Um, I mean, I hear about Stiankam Skral going to get into operation opening the mine up and, and all of that. Um, but at the moment we have existing uh, resource here that one can, you know, do something with in the in the next step. From the technology side, I think between Mintech, Stiencom Scroll, and the Thorium Network, uh, it sounds as though you know there's there's a lot of work that has been done in in looking at the technology that would be uh, necessary. And then in terms of the financing, you know. Uh, it, it seems as though with the IDC and so on, there's, there is a, a massive opportunity as, uh, as, as uh, Kahisu and, and Isaac have been mentioning. Um, and then the DMRE also brought in the government incentives that one can, can tap into. So for me, there's a lot of, uh, you know, stars aligning uh, here. Um, you know, then of course, also the supply and demand of, of rare earths. Um, so, I, I'm back to the bankable feasibility study, if that is, uh, you know, the want to go into a staged approach, if that is the next thing that has to be done on this, uh, you know, collaborative uh, thing, then, um, you know, it looks as though they could possibly be financing either through IDC or then from the government uh, incentives on, on that. So, that would... You know, from my understanding of today and listening to everybody, that sounds as though that is, um, you know, it is within the art of the possible. I know the devil is in the detail, but at least if we got the enthusiasm and principle agreement on these kind of things, then that will take us far. Thank you. Thanks. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's also what, what encourages me and what has actually exceeded my expectations is the, is the, um, the enthusiasm. Um, and, and my concern now is, is how do we um, not lose the momentum that we have? Um, uh, I think we have had a, a fairly unique opportunity here today um, for the collection of people and minds that we have together in a single conversation and, and, um, it's it's a it's, it's an opportunity that we I think are not going to that's not going to repeat itself um, very soon. So um, I think we need to make the best of today's conversation and and um, see how how do we actually maintain contact and maintain movement um, and actually um, you know if 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 there's anything that that um, 
anyone is is uh, relying on from somebody else that that we make it known if there is a, 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 a maybe a oh I would hate to have it a committee you know sort of <laughs> but uh, if there could be a, a meeting of minds of of what could be what do we see as the next um, step or the next milestone um, that we are waiting for or the, um, you know to to take the next action or um, if it is to be a, a feasibility study would it be a feasibility study then in other words of of um, of Steenkamp scroll would it be a feasibility study of Tronox monazite um, you know and and who is to decide that um, I don't know, Trevor. I mean, sort of. Uh, do you feel you need a bankable feasibility study, or, or is is that what your your financiers would would demand of you next? Or do you have such confidence in your in your flow sheets that you have developed to date that you can just um, scale them up to production? Uh, yes, we've done a lot of work already on our uh, bankable feasibility study. And I guess we're about 80% complete or 80 to 90%. Uh, yes, it is necessary, uh, not only for the financiers, but uh, for our own um, confidence. Uh, we, we are going to raise money for the um, Steen Camp Trial Project. Um, a lot of money has been invested already, as I mentioned, about 500 million Rand over the last um, 10 years. So we are at a compared to other rare earth projects at a very advanced stage. Um, so we now want to raise money to bring the mine back into production, which as I mentioned is a very small amount compared to a greenfield site, to build a monazite concentration plant. Also for the volume of production of 5,000 tons a year, uh, that's also a small investment relatively, another $5 million. Uh, and then to crack the monazite and um, separate the thorium from the rare earths, we may need about another 15 million. So we'll be looking to raise about $25 million um, in the region of 400 million rand uh, to commence construction um, this year. Uh, we have all the permits in place so that we can start construction. It's shovel ready. We could start construction tomorrow. And um, <clears throat> now with the pricing developments, um, um, the markets are ready to provide finance for our kind of project. Um, there's great enthusiasm, not only for the project itself, but also amongst investors to finance um, our project. So we are confident that we will get underway this year. Yeah. And do you think the IDC might uh, feature in your financing plans or... Is that asking prematurely? <laughs> uh, uh, the IDC has, invest, has uh, sent three teams of people to Steen Camps uh, the mining team, the chemical team, and the motor uh, industry team as well. And um, uh, I think they liked our project. And uh, I think we should re engage with the IDC. Our mm -hmm. discussions came to a um, you know, sort of petered out. But um, if you're willing, um, Isaac, and let's start. Let's talk again. Uh, has he? Yeah, I think he's. Yeah, Zitza, you wanna you wanna add something? Can I just ask for my own understanding? Is that? Uh, <clears throat> My understanding is that the plant and so on that Trevor is talking about here is going to be for the Steenkamp scroll ore body. Or would that be able to take, um, you know, resources from, from elsewhere, whether it's the strand monazite or, you know, from the other countries and, and so on? Or are you focused on, you know, your, um, your ore body and all its characteristics? Initially, it is on our ore body um, because we want to go by baby steps, as uh, we discussed earlier, and uh, walk before we try to run. Um, but uh, there will be great potential for expansion. So we want to do our small thing first, the 5,000 tons of monazite concentrate. Um, 
but then we could expand uh, the volume of production to 10, 15, 20,000. Um, we have the facilities and the infrastructure to do that. And then also to do the beneficiation of the, uh, of the uh, concentrate uh, to remove the thorium and uh, produce a mixed rare earth concentrate and then later on to do the separation. So um, there are several phases um, and we hope to go phase by phase and iron out the problems on the way so that we can expand and grow from a solid foundation of knowledge and experience. So we could eventually become this um, uh, rare earth refinery for, for many other um, sources of material. Petrus, if you allow me just to do a follow up on, on that one, um, Trevor, thank you for that. Just uh, for clarity also, um, you know, is it then within the art of the possible that you, you continue with your baby steps, you do the learning, uh, very, very important that, uh, that, uh, that someone does that. But that in parallel, one looks at, uh, you know, for, for a centralized agnostic of where it should be, you know, whether it is at Steengamskral or whether it is at, uh, at another place, that you start looking as to whether, you know, um, all the resources from SADC, you know, whether they will be able to, to go through, uh, through one process, that that work be done. Because if I understand it correctly, Mintek, did it for all the South African resources. So Zandklaptrift, Tiengamskral, the Monazite sands and all of that. And they, you know, from the initial uh, work that they've done, they said, yes, it could be in one, uh, you know, in one, one facility. Um, but exactly how that works, I'm not, not sure. But that you also look then at Namibia, you look at Tanzania, you look at Malawi, and you look at all those things and say, well, would it be possible to do that in one uh, process? Uh, is it possible that these two things can, can run in parallel, that you increase the resource base? Because at the moment you're going to work with your resource, um, but that one actually in, uh, in parallel looking at increasing the, the resource base. Thank you. Hmm. Yes, very much so. Uh, when it comes to monazite, there are, as we discussed earlier, Eric as well, there are sources of monazite in Southern Africa. And uh, not everybody's going to build a monazite cracking plant. Uh, on those various locations. Uh, monazite cracking, which means separating and storing the thorium, does require a nuclear license. I know it's not called that nowadays, but uh, the infrastructure from a legal point of view to um, separate and store the, the thorium. Um, so yes, it is our intention long term uh, to become a large processor of monazite from Steenkamp Skrull and from other sources. Uh, what may be a bit more problematic, uh, and we don't, we haven't done any research on this, um, if people offer us bastazite or zenotime, um, we have not done any work on that. Um, so we're, we're not able to um, entertain that at this stage, um, but maybe that's a, another area of study that could be undertaken later on. Yeah, Sam, I don't know if you um, can want to comment on that. Uh, Sam Koena, if you're still here. Yes, I'm still here, Petras. Yes. Uh, uh, yes, I, I think it's a, it's a good initiative uh, that is coming from, uh, from Stenkang Skral. But uh, what I can say is that if they are maybe worried that maybe their plant will not be able to process other type of rare earth minerals. I think that is where companies like Mintech come in. So we are available to do test work, maybe to uh, imitate their process to see whether the other type of pop bodies that maybe are coming from elsewhere will be able to, to, to be treated by their process. So yeah, I think that is where we are coming in as Mintech. It will we'll give you an opportunity just now. I just want to also ask the same question to, to Dion Kemp. Um, Bastocyte and uh, Xenotine, does it make any difference to your plasma process and that? Um, 
starting with xenotone. Xenotone is exactly the same as monazite. It's a rare earth phosphate. And the answer is no, it makes no difference. Uh, from what the plasma sees, it's exactly the same thing. As for basnesite, uh, it can be a little bit different because the products that you get out post-plasma treatment can include the, uh, the fluorines. And that is going to involve other things because if you don't take care of the fluorine problem, you could potentially lose 33% uh, of your rare earths. But there are methods of taking the uh, rare fluorides out. Uh, once I've completely leached um, the plasma treated ore and you've got the rare fluorides there, then you can just, there are methods of converting fluorides to hydroxides and other chemicals. So the answer is yes, you can, 100%. Okay, so it's, it's a tool, we have in the toolbox that we can pull out if we, if we think we need it. Um, can we, um, Ed, you wanna say something? Yeah, hi, uh, you can hear me, yeah? Yes, yes. Yeah, I can fully appreciate the fact that um, Trevor would like to fully um, develop his own uh, flow sheet on the Steamcom Scroll before he can be open to uh, tolling any other monazite feedstocks. So um, as a collective, we need to decide uh, how could we kind of start a, a centralized hub, um, as we've heard. Um, how would we go about that? Obviously, um, we have Mintech with their facilities of conventional cracking on site. And of course, then we have um, Dean's um, uh, more pilot scale kind of uh, experimental work on the plasma stuff. So these are things that could be going uh, parallel. You've got the conventional cracking routes and obviously there's the, um, the developing uh, plasma technology. But the fact is um, the depository for any uh, radionuclide waste streams. Um, obviously, uh, Trevor and Co. at Steam are uh, ahead of the curve with that, with the um, uh, equivalent nuclear license or, or whatever it's called now. Um, at the same time, if MinTech are prepared to take some experimental feedstocks, um, are they prepared and have the facility to um, uh, um, dispose of safely the uh, radionuclide um, uh, waste streams because of course no matter what the feedstock is there's going to be a different variable there is going to be some um, radionuclide um, waste so until we could get access to um, uh, Trevor's depository um, what's the interim or what could be the interim solution to that if we want if one wanted to get the um, test work started now Sam, I suppose you can easily answer that. We can, uh, we can, we, we can handle um, any nuclear related material. We are licensed as well. We do a lot of uranium work, etc. So it's not a problem to do test work yet, if it contains any nuclear material. Yeah, even, even with um, ramp up, for example. Well, it depends what the final scale is going to be. But I mean, we are licensed and we have tested. We've tested in that facility that Sam showed. We show we have tested up to 500 kilograms of material through there. In total. OK. Thanks, Elmar. Uh, Zitza, yes? Yeah, Peter, so I, I, I want us to just uh, look a bit more at this, um, you know, the in issue of the thorium. Um, what, what concerned me is when Ed started talking about, you know, taking on the legacy. Are we willing to take on the legacy of sitting with this, uh, this, uh, this as a waste, you know, the thorium as a waste? Now, in my understanding, you know, there's no no organisation anywhere in this on this planet that has got a 
you know, authorization to, to store um, radioactive materials, long-lived, um, high levels of radioactive materials for infinity. You know, that is a continuing challenge for on the, on the, on the nuclear side. So, you know, either it has to be sold um, because uh, I think it was Dr. Dion who said, you know, we want, we want this, uh, we want the stuff, we want the material, it's, it's not a waste, it is a resource uh, for us. So it either has to be that, or we need to look at say, you know, is there a technology or whatever that is going to make sure that we, we at least reduce, if not completely eliminate uh, the, the, the waste. So I think there we have to, because if, if we land up of a whole, as a nation with a whole lot of uh, nuclear waste, um, you know, high level, long lived and, and so on, that is a challenge. Um, that is a challenge that is very, very uh, difficult to manage and regulate, uh, regulate that. And so either we have to have a technology that eliminates that or we need to have a market. Because um, I'm not sure with the thorium network and saying they need it for the thorium power plants. Um, I mean, thorium power plants is not a new idea. It's been, you know, researched over many, many decades. But when, when is, do we expect this demand to, to take off? Um, because I don't, yeah, I'm just very concerned. We don't want to take on a massive legacy here as a nation. I don't think that would be prudent. Thank you. Yeah, and if the one technology is, is, is basically at the doorstep and the other one still has 50 years to go, but I think uh, Dion wants to provide an answer to that. Uh, yes, I've got a number of answers on everything that, that's just been said. Uh, firstly, um, on the plasma, it's now a pilot. It's already commercial. Secondly, the thorium is not a waste. Like uh, Sitsa said, we want it and we can use it. We are currently developing technology to run on thorium. So, yeah, all of that. Uh, something I didn't quite get to in my presentation uh, was how do we get the... Um, how do we get the... the, 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 the uh, the thorium out. Because of what I do in the plasma with my material, I'm able to get the thorium out separately. I can get it out as a pure thorium oxide. Some of the other radionuclides like radium and stuff like that, you will have them where you use conventional or any other process and they're going to have to be dealt with. But that's not the point. The point is that we can take the thorium and we can use it now. Um, that's basically where I want to go with that. Um, but yeah, the, the key issue that I want to reiterate is that the thorium is not a waste. It's only a waste if you've got nothing to do, if you've got no solution for it. The difference is we do have a solution for it. And uh, the basic answer is put it in a nuclear reactor and use it as fuel to make electricity. We have, a, we have that problem at the moment. Thank you. Well, Dion, it, it sounds like you're ready to talk to Trevor to just uh, for his uh, thorium. Uh, we have already been engaging with Trevor for quite a while. And uh, I don't want to say any more unless, Trevor, you would like to <laughs> go further into that conversation at the moment. You just as, yeah yeah as you said, Diane, we have been talking for quite a long time, and I think our engagement is going to become much more meaningful very soon. Um, and I'm looking forward to it very much. Um, I would also like to say that um, when it comes to the storage of thorium and the legacy issue, um, the licensing arrangement that we have does allow us to store thorium at Steenkampskral. Uh, there's no time limit on it. Uh, and I know these radionuclides can last a long time, but we rather um, res look at Sinkam Skral as like a thorium bank where we'll have thorium in reserve for future use. Um, I think the technology that um, 
Deanne is talking about is going to develop rapidly over the next 10, 20, 30 years. And um, the thorium will become a, a valuable resource. And so at Steenkamp's Crawl, we can store it, look after it under carefully licensed conditions. And that um, it'll be not so much of a legacy issue, but rather an inheritance for future, for future generations. Well, at least I see the Chinese have also, are they claiming to be building a, a thorium nuclear plant or is it, are they planning, or did I read the article wrong, but it looked like they are going ahead with plans to build a, a thorium um, energy generation plant? Petrus, they're way ahead of that. Um, I went to a thorium conference in China about 10 years ago and the director of a um, a nuclear reactor project uh, stood up and did a presentation and he said he was going to they were planning and designing a small modular thorium salt reactor that would run on thorium and lo and behold about three months ago they announced that they'd completed the construction of the first prototype um, small modular thorium um, powered reactor uh, in inner mongolia near baoto and that uh, it was now producing electricity. They'd switched it on and it was producing electricity. It's a 100 megawatt plant. Uh, and they plan to build these um, small reactors, uh, dozens of them, hundreds of them all over China, especially in areas where they have no water. Uh, most uh, light water reactors like Kuberg require huge amounts of water for cooling them. Um, uh, whereas these uh, small modular plants do not require water, so they can be built in dry barren areas. Uh, so this is very much underway in China, and um, I think it's going to, they're going to build lots of them, and they will also sell them to other countries around the world. So there could be, over the next 5, 10, 20 years, hundreds of these reactors built all over the world. It, it's really the beginning of a new era. Mm -hmm. And... I'd just like to say again on thorium, I mentioned it earlier. Thorium as the national, um, as, they, as they discovered in England many years ago, uh, it, it can't be weaponized. And um, most of the reactors built in the world were designed in the, after the second world war, when there was an arms race and a cold war and material was needed to make uh, nuclear weapons. And um, most um, nuclear reactors like the Kuberg design uh, were built to produce material in the form of plutonium to make weapons. So our whole nuclear industry got off to a very bad start <laughs> with the wrong motives, the wrong ideas, the wrong, as far as we're concerned now, um, because now we want the nuclear power and we do not want the weapons grade material. And thorium addresses that issue. That's interesting. But of, of, of course, if anybody is going to have a thorium problem, it would be China, right? Because um, well, they would have it of a different order of magnitude than you know, to, compared to anybody else. So uh, they certainly have the incentive. And as I understand, also, they've been, they, 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 they are ahead of everybody else in the entire rare earth. Um, you know, because they've done the homework, they've, 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 they've made the investment and so on. But I, from what I understand, they have also got a little bit ahead of actually getting the rare earths extraction and marketing going, but not equally giving attention to the, um, to the environmental aspects until more recently. Um, and and, and the, I suppose the thorium reactors would be a way of trying to, to alleviate that problem. Yeah, then all of what you said is relevant, yeah. Ed, you've got something? Yeah, just to add, uh, I am very much an advocate for thorium power. Um, the reason why I'm bringing up the subject is that if we are serious about developing uh, rare earth processing in Southern Africa, what you've got to have, like we have with mining, the public perception of mining is a challenge and even more so when it comes to radionuclides. So yeah. from day dot, this communication with all these positive things that um, Trevor and Deanne have kind of put out there, that would need to kind of go alongside any proposal for doing such work.
I think that's a highly relevant point you raise. No, because we could be, yeah, if anybody who's, who's developing a project could be stopped dead in their tracks if it is, um, if it doesn't pass um, that scrutiny. But at the same time, if the message is out there that at one hand you are providing the specialist metals for the new lower carbon technologies, and you're um, trying to solve the energy crisis uh, at the same time, and non-nuclear proliferation, it's it's a it's a win-win on many levels. But of course, yeah. the news needs to be um, that information needs to be carefully managed and put out to the public at large. I mean, we're talking to the converted here, but it's yeah. obviously um, getting that message out if you were to kind of um, develop. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and, and it, it should start um, immediately if it hasn't started yet, because um, once you surprise people, um, they, they will have been spooked and, and will then be skeptical uh, if you haven't actually been open um, a, yeah, about it uh, from from the, from day one. Exactly. Um, trying trying to patch it up after the horse has bolted is is going to be a very bad strategy. But whereas so one should actually come forward with it um, immediately and actually start um, uh, advocating it. Um, yeah, so that people should start begging us to employ it. <laughs> Uh, as opposed to actually them discovering something which which then seems to have gone um, you know sort of under the blankets and um, it's it's been uh, covered up and and then it looks like a big expose um, and then yeah then to try to patch up relations would be would be a, a, a very bad situation. But but that's why I, I, yeah, and that's why I've said this before. That's why I always enjoy uh, these conversations uh, with the SAIMM and associates is the fact that we have these conversations. You can go to other rare earth conferences or other mining conferences, and these issues aren't brought up. Okay, and then of course a lot of these projects end up coming into problems because they'd swept that under the carpet beforehand. They're like, oh, our shareholders don't need to know about this. Thing is, yeah. it's, it's gonna it's gonna bite you at some stage. And thing is, yeah. This needs to come out now, and that's what's really refreshing, the fact that we, we do talk about this. If I may uh, comment here, our uh, policy at Steenkamp's Kral is to be truthful, honest, uh, open with um, the communities around us and with the environment in general. Um, we want everybody to know we've got monazite, to know we've got thorium, to know that what the risks are, to know how we manage those risks, to know that we're licensed to... Uh, to handle these uh, radioactive materials uh, and be completely open and honest. And we've invited people to presentations at Steenkampschwell where we explain all of these things and we'll carry on doing it. Um, uh, and um, we don't want to have anything swept under the carpet and we don't want to have to deal with uh, problems that suddenly jump out at us in the future. Yeah. So uh, I'd like to suggest that we maybe we, maybe all of us in the with a rare earth project or rare earth ambitions in South Africa, we should um, uh, get together to discuss these thorny issues and the best way to handle them, the best way to communicate them, the best way to manage them with all of the regulatory authorities as well, including the the NNR, the MRE, uh, so that we all proceed in a harmonious, <laughs> well planned, well managed way, yeah. and, and we don't get any shocks. Yeah. Yeah, and it should be discussed at forums where that where we do not only have the mining fraternity and so on present and the technical people. It should be out there in the in the um, general public's conversation and and in their mind. Because um, yeah, once once somebody get hold of it who has maybe political aspirations to make a name mm -hmm. for himself and um, you know want a, a topic to uh, to, you know, to ride on. Could then turn this in, you know, against, um, you know, sort of uh, against the mining fraternity, and actually, uh, yeah, it could could turn could turn ugly. Uh, Graham, I think you put yeah. your hand up. Yes, yeah, so I just want to make a comment on what we're discussing right now. You know, if if we're looking at doing a centralised processing um, site, whether it's on Stinkham's Crawl or wherever. 
if you are putting that site together, you'll be scaling it to a certain supply process and volumes. And if you do not comply with all of these things, you've got a very, very unstable supply. And it's going to be a major issue if we have a plant that's expecting X amount of tons and it gets minus 20X. Yeah. And it'll, this whole thing will just implode on itself. So from a Syncom's crawl point of view, we are making sure that we're doing everything to as close as possible to 100% that we can to remain compliant, that we don't end up with any of these surprises. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, Petrus, if you think it's a good idea, um, we, we've um, worked our way through many of the um, obstacles, the um, restrictions, the uh, licensing arrangements, the legislative issues. Uh, so we are at a fairly advanced stage where we're authorized and licensed and permitted to proceed. Um, if what if our experience can be of any use to any of you, um, perhaps we should con consider um, having a meeting. We'll invite you all to Steen Camp Scroll and show you what we've done and how we've done it and the lessons we've learned. Uh, it might make it easier for everybody. Thanks for the invitation. And um, <clears throat> I'm also just thinking, you know, how do we get the message out to the broader public um, more quickly and um, the likes of the SOIMM, I think, can, can certainly also play a, a big role there um, to guide us as to how one communicates this to the, to the broader public. And well, in, well, first of all, actually formulating what is the message and, and, and what is it that we, because it is actually a, a bit of a complicated, complex picture that is emerging uh, with different companies possibly collaborating. There's different technologies at play and there are different issues at play. Um, and so one, one needs to actually, yeah, first contemplate what is the story that we, the storyline that needs to go out. And then secondly, how do we actually put it out in, in an efficient manner that it reaches the widest possible audience in a favorable, in, in a favorable way then? Zitsa? Idris, the way I see it is that there's three parallel streams that need to be looked at. So the one is about the communication, which, uh, you know, all the points that you and Trevor made that needs to be addressed in that. In parallel, I think we, you know, we need to cheer on the, the people who are on the cutting edge, who've been investing in this, who have had the patient and all of that. So I think the, the visit to Stiengkampskral and uh, seeing what is there, I think it is very important you know, that we, we get that understanding, we get those learnings and all of that um, from, from, you know, long experience that, that they have and, and that they've gone through. So I think it is very important that we do everything that we possibly can to support, you know, in whatever shape or size uh, as the income scroll um, in, in what they're endeavoring. And then the third stream is about the, you know, a collaborative, uh, a collaborative processing facility and to hold that, you know, venue agnostic. So it could be a steel bomb scroll, could be one option, another option could be to, you know, do a centralized thing somewhere, uh, somewhere else. Um, so I think those things need to all in parallel. But the one thing we, you know, is absolutely critical is that the baby steps that uh, Trevor, Trevor is talking about, that they are enabled to take those. So let's say there is an issue around the new, uh, the regulatory issues or whatever the case may be, you know, that we support and say, you know, those things have to be addressed, but they seem to be addressed uh, already. But I think just understanding what they're doing there, where they're going and so on, I think that is, uh, you know, it will not only be a good learning experience, but also showing that uh, support and that we, you know, appreciate what what all the investment in time and effort and <laughs> Trevor has got much more grayer than when I met him the first time. <laughs> so not got the pictures; he's got the gray hair uh, to shoot. To shoot. <laughs> yes. But for me, um, Beatrice, I think that is the thing. And you mentioned just now about a committee. I think you've got a coalition of the willing here that you've convened uh, today very eloquently together with SAIMM. 
you know, I think we need to build on this enthusiasm, the inspiration that is there, the, the market conditions they are now, you know, the opportunity in that. Um, and, you know, my suggestion, we, we don't like much about committees, although we still have them. But we, <laughs> I, was, I was looking for another word. I couldn't find it quickly. <laughs> No, I think it is. Uh, it it needs to be. You know, we've got leadership forums now that uh, at CEO level typically, and then you know, much more action driven. So task teams or something like that. You know, that yeah, it, it, yeah. it yeah. sound too stale. Or you've got it at a forum. You know, why don't you continue with this title of today? That's a good word. Yeah, it is a forum. Uh, it, it means it's a place where some work gets done. Yeah, the exactly. committee has, has a different meaning to me. <laughs> I, I really the, the term Sorry. you mentioned earlier is appropriate, the coalition of the willing. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so uh, I, I, I think that is, that is what I take away. And as I said, my time is getting shorter on this thing. Okay. Um, I see a, a lot of... Um, you know, a lot is possible in the art of the possible if parties are yeah, yeah. enthusiastic and, uh, you know, the stars align. Thanks. Yeah. Now, so if, if, if and when you, you quietly need to slip out uh, of the meeting, uh, let me then sort of say so long that your contributions are, are, are much appreciated and have been very valuable. Um, I just want to test from some of the, the members present, uh, you know, who have... Uh, that, that we don't actually steamroller anybody. The, the kind of picture that implicitly is, is emerging from the way we are discussing it then is that um, we are backing Steenkamp Scroll in their baby steps and actually launching their project. And that would sort of open up the way um, for the rest of the... Um, projects to maybe have a little bit of an easier road to develop them. But I mean, we do not want to be dictating that to them. Uh, I don't know, are there any counter ideas to that or, or any of the other participants? We have Frontier, Broadmind, um, uh, E-Tech, you know, are any of you guys maybe feeling less than comfortable with that concept or are you going your own way or is, or is this actually um, in line with, you know, does it actually, you know, sort of um, take your agreement in it? Uh, I see a tumbling there, your hand. You want to add something? Yes. Hi, Petros and everybody. Hi. Um, I just wanted to first say thank you, Petrus, for organizing this and to everybody that has contributed. It has been insightful. Um, I, I think for me, I speak from a point of view of like a researcher, definitely not, um, the, you know, uh, I've been working on, on rare earth uh, work as a researcher since 2012. In, in terms of like flow sheet development, technology development at Mintech. And as a, as a relatively younger person who's passionate about the subject, you know, from since 2012, you know, one has been looking at the news to see what project is breaking ground locally. Um, and, and, you know, pr project like Spence Gums Riles and Gops Rift is some of the projects that I've been looking at or Glenova and hoping that something happens. And I, I hope, and I know a lot of work has gone into those projects and, and really looking forward to Spence Gums Rile, um, you know, starting up and, and leading the, the pack. Um, I want, there's a question that I have is on, on a lot of the times during the whole topic of of rare earths, one often had of things like there's an, a window of opportunity, like uh, projects that that projects outside of China have to start up before the market becomes or b before the market does not necessarily need any more new projects. Are we as Southern Africa still on track? Like, what is the window of opportunity um, for? Southern African projects or African projects or projects outside of, of China, if I should put it that way, to, to do this? Is it like an infinite thing? Pro probably not. But like, is there anybody, especially the specialists in the field, who can, who can advise? What's this? Is there, is there an agency thing? 
what's the window of opportunity? I'm curious, like me, myself, from like a, a researcher's point of view. Yeah, if I, if I correctly interpret what you're asking, is it, is there a, a particular date by which we need to move or we're going to lose the opportunity? Yes. Is, 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 the, is the one question. On the other hand, the question is, we definitely don't want to move so early that we may be just um, trying to catch a bubble which then disappears by the time you get there. Right, um, yes. You know, if, if it is a bubble, then we should rather just let it pass. Mm. Uh, and not catch the opportunity because <laughs> you will mm. be just in time to have wasted your money. I, yes, I, I suppose if I, you know, I'm sure Trevor can um, can say something about that. Possibly some of the other uh, and so on can maybe also comment because they've actually done. They will have done that homework um, right. to make sure that that does not happen. I don't know, Trevor, do you, do you want to add anything? Mm -hmm. Yes, please. <clears throat> the last time rare earth prices went up a lot was in 2010. And the reason why they went up then was that uh, there was a dispute in the South China Sea between Japan and China over the ownership of some islands. And China um, banned, they put an embargo on exports of rare earth to Japan. So Japan scoured the world and bought just about every rare earth they could find. Uh, and they pushed the prices up very high. Um, and then a few years later, the dispute over the islands was resolved. Uh, China then allowed exports to Japan and rare earth prices came down again. So that was an artificial price uh, bubble that was caused by these geopolitical events. In the last two years, prices have gone up for a di very different reason. Um, they're going up, uh, and when I say rare earth prices, not all rare earth prices, as I pointed out earlier, the prices of cerium, lanthanum, and one or two others are, are very low and uh, will probably remain low for a long period of time. But when it comes to electric vehicles and wind turbines, um, when it comes to decarbonization, when it comes to global warming, um, when it comes to uh, phasing out uh, internal combustion engine vehicles, um, the fundamentals in the industry now are very, very different to what they were in 2010. Uh, now we have very strong and rapidly growing uh, fundamental demand for uh, the magnetic rare earths. And uh, just about every study you look at um, uh, forecasts that the demand for these uh, rare earths will double and double again over the next five to ten years. Countries like Norway will ban the sale of internal combustion engines from 2025. And many other countries, um, Sweden, Denmark, um, Finland, and others will follow suit in 2030. Um, countries like France, Germany, Britain will ban the sale of internal combustion engines by 2040, 45, 50. Uh, so sales of electric vehicles were 1 million vehicles um, three years ago. Uh, two years ago, it was two, 2 million. And last year, it was 6 million electric vehicles were manufactured and sold around the world. Uh, windmills, um, every day you see it, uh, announcements and articles about how many wind turbines are being built in the North Sea and um, in America and um, in other parts of the world. They're being built at a rapid and accelerating rate. So the fundamentals this time are very different. So. Uh, our belief is that, and our conviction uh, is that rare earth prices um, will um, remain. No, not that actually for these four rare earths that are used to make the magnets, they go into the electric vehicles and wind turbines. Uh, they'll probably double again over the next few years. So, yes, we have a window of opportunity now. Um, the economic conditions are now good for us to finance our project and commence construction. Um, but I think the demand for our products will be far greater than our supply and that we'll struggle to keep up. Yeah. Thank you very much for that, Trevor. I think that I, I personally needed the differentiation between the artificial price bubble due to geopolitics in 2010 and the actual demand due to um, clean energy, renewable energy, electric vehicles, because those are completely, completely different things. And I think to follow up on that, I think I once emailed you, Trevor, on work that we're currently doing at Mintech on um, uh, 
rare earth metal productions uh, on the four uh, magnetic rare earth metals, neodymium, prosodymium, and induced, etc. Um, so we've done some of that work. And uh, obviously, when we motivated for that, it was in line with um, the the renewable energy sh share of wind energy in South Africa and the fact that ideally, when we're looking at rare earth production, we want to do the full value chain and supply local demand, and then we've got the wind energy demand locally. And that's that that's just like a qualitative um, assumption on our side. But from you as a person who has worked in this, this industry, is we hope, I think with all the commodities in the country, you always hear from from um, the Department of Minerals and Energy that they want full value chain beneficiation. Um, so what's your view on the idea of full value beneficiation for rare earths in particular to supply local demand of rare earth magnets, at least at the very least for um, wind energy and wind turbines and things like that? as it constitute the largest share of um, the, the renewable energy that's projected, the contracts, yes. What you're saying is music to my ears. <laughs> I, <laughs> <Love> uh, it. <laughs> and it even adds to the enthusiasm and inspiration that I mentioned earlier. Um, I share your ideals, your objectives completely. And um, we're too small to undertake all of that by ourselves, but so we're very keen to team up with uh, people so that we can build a team that uh, has the skills, the resources, the capabilities to do what you're saying. It's a, it's a long-term um, project to complete all that value chain. Uh, but if we don't start now, <laughs> now that we have the window of opportunity, the, the later we leave it, the later the achievement will be. So let's start soon. Correct. Thank you very much, Trevor, for that. I'll continue communicating with you on that part. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's groundwork. We're literally breaking ground from a South African perspective, whilst the producers are also doing the bulk work of actually breaking ground and producing. But we'll continue to working on our side and communicating with you on that, like uh, the, 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 the metal and magnet production part of it, because we are also still very young. Um, in, in, in doing that back here. Thank you for that, Trevor. Please, I look forward to hearing from you. Okay, great. Thanks, Tubeling and, and, and Trevor. Uh, if I can just get back to, our, you know, it's sort of, uh, it's becoming the time of the day where, where people one by one uh, need to start going. So uh, I suppose we gradually need to start tapering towards a conclusion. Um, so as I was saying earlier, I just wanted to make sure that you know, um, we are not just uh, sweeping um, everybody along with something that may not suit everybody. Uh, but as as uh, you, as I read it, um, basically the direction in which the conversation is is going is that um, is that uh, Steenkamp's crawl is probably going to be. They seem to be sort of uh, you know quite well advanced in the implementation of their project and that um, they would probably be leading the pack and uh, their launching of their project would probably uh, at least in some way help to facilitate the launching of other projects in town um, and and that others who come after Steenkamp Scroll would be um, sort of riding in the wake of Steenkamp Scroll, but is, is that actually uh, reflecting the the uh, feeling of everybody else? Uh, are there any others who have counter ideas or who um, who've already plotted a different course or who would actually rather just sort of like stay uncommitted and, 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 and independent in all of this um, and uh, who may not need who may not really um, like to be part of the conversation as it is actually unfolding at the moment i just want to you know be fair to everybody and um i also have a question uh, does query Vantasi support the central processing facility well 
maybe uh, I don't know if there's anybody who can uh, maybe fairly answer that, but um, Rachisu, I don't know if, if you're still on the line, uh, you know, sort of, I don't know if you can make any comment to that. It's, uh, it's a quite a uh, direct question, but <laughs> maybe you have an answer to that? No, I don't have an answer to that, unfortunately. Um, all I can say is that uh, as Minister of um, Mineral Resources and Energy, uh, the Minister would definitely support any efforts to increase uh, domestic mineral beneficiation. But as to whether it's a, a central processing center or something else, I'm not sure. Thank you. Okay, um, Mariki? Um, yes, um, Petrus. Um... He, he actually, he knows about it. So I think in principle, he probably s supports it, but in terms of, um, you know, giving the funding, that's a different question. But I think, um, you know, just from what I know that there were previous discussions with, with the minister and he wasn't in, in disagreement. So yeah. I think let's, let's be positive that he will yeah. support it. Yeah, look, on, I, I cannot believe that the minister would be against anything that's going to create jobs, is going to, um, in, uh, in, you know, uh, grow the local um, manufacturing industry or even commodity industry and so on. Um, as for funding, I think the message is, look, the IDC is the, um, is the mechanism for obtaining um, state-supported, state-backed funding, although it is actually operated on, on um, self-funding principles. Um, so, um, yeah, I don't think it, it, it necessarily needs to be a, a political issue. It's, it's not something, it's, it's probably not something that is at this stage uh, sitting as a, as a governmental political issue really it's it's i think it's a it's a more economic market development kind of issue and 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 the minister i don't don't think will actually sanction anything that um, you know is going to uh is that well you will be against anything that that is going to grow the industry it, it's but but certainly we have the 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 responsibility to manage the um the public perception of our project as we have discussed and um, that that is totally a, a, that is where it could become a political issue if it is if it is actually um, if if it if it surprises people as and and then comes across as something that is that is that has been hidden away or that that holds unpleasant surprises that that is where um, the politicians may then have to choose side and that is where it will become political and it is, that is a situation to be avoided. Sydney? Oh, yes, uh, thanks Petrus. Um, yeah, just been absorbing the comments basically that have come through from uh, yeah, most of the people who have spoken. Um, look, the key issues that we need to be looking at, as I say, this is basically looking at this being a static uh, uh, initiative. Um, yeah, it's just sort of unfortunate yeah, most of the discussions that we've been having yeah, it's sort of uh, centralized within, within South Africa. Um, so I think one of the key issues we need to be considering um, as a forum is what is the criteria in terms of setting up the centralized facility? Um, there's been a number of issues discussed. Uh, obviously, one of the main thing is the resource. Where can you get uh, the biggest resource that feeds into this facility, whereby it could make the facility easier to run because it was constant throughput coming through. Um, other issues, obviously, to look at is the infrastructure development of where it should be placed. Um, other issue is to look at, uh, you know, the possible government funding of it. So I think the key issues that we should come up from here is what criteria are we going to set in terms of considering where this uh, facility can be placed? And for us, uh, from Broadmind in Namibia, we'd we'll be also keen to, to find out what are we looking at, um, because obviously we'd want to lobby for, for um, having, you know, uh, uh, 
a, a big resource and uh, yeah, see how it fits in to what we're discussing here. That's our comment. Well, while we have you on the line, um, if I could repeat the question to you as sort of, would it, um, would you see it beneficial to your own project? You know, if, if, if Steenkamp Scroll were to, were to launch and actually, you know, um, lead the way, uh, would, would you see that facilitating in any way your own project um, from Broadmind's perspective? Doesn't actually make things easier for you to proceed. I mean, actually having having proven that the market is there, at having um, a possible tail treatment facility there. Um, are we just uh, talking naively about things that we don't know about, or would that actually be somehow facilitating to your own project development? Yeah, um, I think yeah. My comment there. I mean, yeah, as you say, this is all about uh, collaboration and. Uh, uh, you know, people bringing in uh, ideas and, and resources uh, together. Um, so it's not something that we're just looking at as benefiting uh, broadman. As we say, this is a static initiative. But yeah, the forum should basically also guide us. You know, coming into the into into play in terms of what would be the main criteria we're looking at. So I mean, Simon Scroll has uh, you know been at it for a while and have made headway. I mean, it's it's a case of Again, what criteria looks at it, um, and what criteria is is key to make sure that the initiative is as successful as possible from all the parties that are involved. Yeah. Well, each project has, of course, their their stakeholders and their their shareholders, and um, the projects are there to serve them. It is their money going into it. Um, so I suppose that they will dictate what the you know the criteria are, um, and 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 um, project managers will not be allowed to venture into space that is that is that the shareholders are feeling uncomfortable with. That's that's where I see a possibility for different projects going maybe in different directions because um, they know they do not share necessarily shareholders with with the same view of the world you know if we if we are to then um start plotting a course forward as i say and and, and as to not actually lose the wonderful momentum we have built up and and um with the uh, the level of enthusiasm that there is it you know we we cannot um allow it to to go to waste what would be uh, i mean the next step i suppose um finding a way of actually keeping in touch with one another would i think be one um one way to uh, one thing to do um now we don't want to be breathing down at one another's necks every every day but on the other hand we don't want the entire topic to to go cold. Um, it seems to me, actually, if I may throw in a, a suggestion that, that um, Trevor's um, invitation, and he said it more than once, so I'm starting to assume that he's serious about this, to actually pay a visit um, to the mine, and it may actually provide an, an, an opportunity to touch base again with one another as to um, how things are going and um, actually having seen physically the, 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 the circumstances there would, would actually maybe also help to, to improve our own insight into the, into the physics of the, of, the under, of the thing that we are undertaking. Um, anybody for or against that? Um, so what I'm basically proposing, what if we, if we, um, arrange for a day where everybody who is interested um, from, from this forum to actually attend it, that we all um, fly down there one day and actually and actually meet again as a forum um, at Steenkamp Scroll. Is that, that's, that's one way of doing it. I want to assure all of you. So you put yourself You're on, on YouTube. YouTube. 
<clears throat> David, can you repeat that? You were on mute. Uh, yeah, um, you asked if me uh, me if if our invitation was serious. I'd like to assure <laughs> you that we, it is, our invitation is serious. Ed. Yeah, I was going to ask, um, would it be logical to be around in Darba in a month's time? That, that sounds like a very logical thing to suggest. Hmm. Yes, that makes sense. Um, we'll think of some dates um, and um, communicate them to you. And then we can see which date suits the most people. Uh, it's a bit too far to do it in one day, um, so I yeah. suggest uh, going up to Fan Rainsdorp, um, staying in the hotel, going to the mine, and then uh, there are good facilities in the hotel in Fan Rainsdorp to, uh, and we also have them at the mine, uh, to do presentations on the geology, on the mineral processing, on the um, NNR regulations, so that we can tell you the uh, about our journey over the last 10 years and as I said it um, I think it may help some of you to um, progress more rapidly with your own projects and would be very keen of course to have the SAIMM the IDC uh, Mintech um, Mineral Resources Council uh, and and others anybody who's interested we would in, we invite you from the mining processing added value magnet making um, for the entire value chain. Ed, could I ask, are you guys going to the Indaba? Uh, yeah, I'll be representing okay. ETEC and the Eureka project at Indaba, yes. Okay, we'll also be at the Indaba for discussion. So maybe a good good idea to see whoever's there, maybe get together on, on the, in the, the facility. Sounds highly logical, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, great. Uh, are you tourmaling? Uh, yes, Petros, I, I wanted to just enthusiastically mention that I, I you know, me and the people that I work with would be glad to visit the Steenkamp's Rail site and learn everything that has been done because they're that much far ahead. I wanted to also ask in terms of the, the, the discussion today, in terms of whatever uh, the the next discussion that will be had next within the forum i have found the discussions about the the radioactive material regulations and what is to be done and should be done to be very intriguing because from a metallurgical side we get so we let we always just focus on the flow sheet the process and not um the the what happens to the radioactive material and I, I learned quite a lot from um from um uh from um I learned quite a lot about what needs to be done. Is 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 there room for a specific discussion to be had about about that about the, the radioactive aspect, radioactive material storage and everything in the next discussion um specifically. Because I feel that there's probably more that needs to be said about that. I think that's very important and we'll make room for it because it is so important. We'll make sure that subject is addressed adequately. Yeah. Yeah, and then if we start adding the, the um, thorium um, utilization as a product and so on, that becomes a much bigger discussion that is almost the project on its own again. Well, I hope, Diane, that you'll be able to join us um, when this event occurs so that you'll be able to talk about these things. Yeah, I will be glad to come. Great. Glad to be here. Because if, if, if things are, are, are gravitating towards Steenkamp's crowd taking the lead, it, it's um, what it is saying to the rest of us is that... Um, the rest of it puts the rest of us in sort of kind of a supporting role, um, you know, looking at the income scrollers to sort of tell us uh, how, in what ways we could support them and, and further their cause, because by furthering their cause, we, we, we're furthering our own. So um, um, 
you know, that that um, means that we're basically taking our cues from from Steenkamp Skal as to what the next thing is to do. Is that, is that <laughs> I don't want to be the taking a, you know, sort of sitting down on the couch and uh, and 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 just um, you know be told what to do. But um, so on the other hand, it it is um, it's up to those who are in the midst of it uh, at the at the the coal face to um, you know sort of lead the way for the rest of us. I don't know, Trevor, is that? Well, look. On the one hand, um, we hope very very much to be able to provide the leadership. Uh, we have made many mistakes. We've learned a lot, and uh, I hope that we will be able to provide the leadership. On the other hand, we don't want to be arrogant and assume that we know more than any everybody else. That is not the case. Uh, so we'll approach this uh, with humility. Uh, we also yeah. have a lot to learn. Uh, but if we can help um, pr by providing um, some leadership and some guidance from our experience, we'd be delighted to do so. And we invite anybody and everybody who is interested in developing a rare earth industry in South Africa to, to join us. Because it, it certainly seems from, you know, having available to you sort of Mintec, SIMM, the Thorium Network, um, and, and, and the IDC and the Minerals Council, um, those are those are considerable resources to invoke on uh, on any problem that um, you know should um, overcome most obstacles that you may encounter. It yes. seems to me. We welcome their involvement, their participation, their contribution. We welcome it very much, and we yeah. appreciate it very much. Um, how do we proceed with the arrangement then of, of, of meeting again? Is it going to, uh, I suppose, those of us who, who would be attending the Indaba, we could uh, possibly meet one another there, but then sort of around that time, um, it sounds like a, a visit to Steenkamp's Kral is on the cards. And um, would you, would we wait for you to first of all advise on, on, on dates that would be suitable well, could we plan it for a day or two after the Indaba? Uh, I think we need to allow two days to do a, a good visit. Uh, maybe yeah. those two days after the Indaba finishes. It depends on when people yeah. put flights. Yeah. But if we plan it um, well in advance, uh, before yeah. they book their flights, then hopefully um, they can book their flights accordingly. Could, could we ask you for a little bit of information on the logistics, um, hotel or hotels, and uh, routes of getting in and out um, that you suggest? Especially for those people who will be coming from, who may not be familiar with the, with the area. Dave, for a while, could you repeat what you were saying? I was just asking for a tre from Trevor. Um, could we ask maybe for some some guidance on um, the logistics of um, getting to Steenkamp Scroll, um, just especially for the benefit of those who may not be familiar with the area? Uh, we'll discuss it. No, I'll see Trevor's on. Trevor, you just on, on mute, Trevor. Mute. It seems to go on mute even when I don't want it to. <laughs> it's telling me to shut up. I'm talking too much. <laughs> if you're at the Indaba in Cape Town, it's about a four-hour drive north of Cape Town um, to Van Rainsdorp. And I suggest we then stay the night in Van Rainsdorp, go to the mine in the morning, the following morning. And uh, I'd say we need at least four, five, six hours at the mine. Um, and then drive back to Van Rainsdorp and spend a second uh, night there and then drive back to Cape Town the following morning. That's doing it in a, in a fashion that is not hurried, um, where we have ample time to talk about everything. Uh, if people can spare that much time, that's what I would recommend in those days immediately after the Indaba. Well, that gives us an idea. Thank you. Now, we'd obviously want to limit this, limit the 
quantity of people going, especially for going underground, but that we'll discuss yeah. as we go along. Yeah. Yeah, look, we'll try not to limit it. We don't want to tell people who want to come that they can't come. Uh, we really don't want to do that. Um, so uh, we'll accommodate as many as we can, and if, if necessary, we'll do two trips. Oh, okay. I would gladly have suggestions from anybody else um, as to as for ways in which we can ensure that we that we maintain the momentum that we've built up today. Well, we'll prepare uh, a program. Uh, okay. Um, and we'll send it to you, Petrus, for circulation to everybody. And then okay. we'll invite comments. Um, if people want to do different days, different times, whatever, yeah. please let us know. And then we'll make a program that suits um, uh, the majority of the people who would like to attend. Well, sounds great. Okay. Thank you very much. That's... That sounds like a plan and it sounds like an interesting... Um, uh, trip as well. It's a beautiful drive <laughs> up through the Citrusdal and Clan William uh, valleys. We were there on Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and uh, it's a very enjoyable trip for me. It's always like a holiday <laughs> going to Steam Camp Scroll. Yeah. <laughs> wow. As as someone who's actually been there with Trevor and Robbie uh, about a year and a half ago, I can confirm that it's very beautiful and. Uh, very, very, it's an amazing place, even from Renensdorf. It's a beautiful place. Oh, okay. I'm starting to look forward to it. Look, we can, we can, uh, we can carry on for another hour, but um, I'm starting to um, sort of reach the end of my, <laughs> of my uh, powers. Uh, could we maybe start to wrap up and, and have last comments and questions and suggestions? If I may interject, Petros, uh, thanks very much for arranging this amazing event. I've been uh, sitting back listening to everything going on and uh, as the uh, support for Dian for his efforts in South Africa, I'm really impressed with what's happening. Uh, it's I mean, very encouraging, particularly Trevor, where you guys are at with SKK and and what Mintech's up to. So again, look, really happy to see this kind of collaboration coming together and just, yeah, looking forward to more of it. That's all I would add. Thanks very much, Patrice. Thank you very much. It's, a, it's been a pleasure. No, it's, it's, it's been a most rewarding um, discussion to me, I must say. I've uh, enjoyed every moment that I have. I've, I've, as, as I say, I've, I've been really... Um, surprised by the level of enthusiasm that truly there is. So um, I'm delighted for the discussion that we've had. And um, I'm also glad to, to see that it, that there seems to be some movement. There seems to be, um, yeah, a few things have now fallen into place to actually start um, moving us forward to the, to the next step. And that, that is really delightful. Yes, it's very, very, very impressive. And uh, we hope to be down in South Africa soon to, to push things along. We're busy up in the, the northern part of the, uh, of the globe, mainly in yeah. Turkey and Armenia at the moment. Okay. All right, well, I'm going to sign off, everyone. So thanks very much. Great to see everyone. Such a great uh, assembly of people for such a great topic. <laughs> thanks, Tom. Hey, thanks great. for sitting in. Thank you very much. Okay. From Bye -bye. Central, thank you very much for organizing this event. We've enjoyed it very much and uh, you've made a great effort to organize it and we congratulate you on this excellent um, experience that we've all had today. Thank you very much. Uh, it's been like very to, fruitful. I would like to concur with Jeremiah and Trevor. Uh, Petrus, good job on organizing everything and it's a pleasure to meet everybody on this forum. Yeah, thanks for all the participation uh, from everybody. Um, we've we've really had a great group of people together here. I've um, yeah, I've I've been surprised every time. So uh, yeah, thank you very much, and I'm I'm glad for the direction that things seem to be taking. Well, then I think. Uh,
we can we can sign off. Um, we we do have a, a a plan forward, and and we will um, we will see one another again. Then um, either the Endaba and or Steenkamp scroll in in not too long from now. We look forward to it. Thank you, Petrus. Goodbye. Trevor, thank you very much. Okay, goodbye, everybody. Then we're going to close this. And um, you... thank you, Petrus. Yeah, thanks, Petrus. Cheers. Cheers, everyone. Okay. Cheers, everyone.